The time is now 1.16 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education regular meeting of December 14, 2021 is called to order. Marilyn, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? There are individuals who registered to provide public comment. We'll, um, we'll be accepting public comment in person and virtually. We have individuals who are going to do both forms. Um, and I will review the rules. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board, and I'll keep track of time. We will be strictly following the time limits so everyone has an opportunity to speak. It is the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. You may be contacted following the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people, and those disrespecting anyone by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. We will begin public comment with people in the room, followed by those joining us virtually. So we have one person who wants to um, provide comment in person, and that is Howard Barron. Mr. Barron, if you would come to the board table. And after that, we will go to the virtual comments. And Mr. Barron has passed out a document to board members. Please begin. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Barron. I'm the current treasurer of the Bloomfield Hills School Board and a trustee since 2013. My comments today are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of Bloomfield Hills Schools or the Bloomfield Hills School Board. In 2015, as the Michigan constitutionally established education leadership organization with the powers of general planning, coordination, and supervision, you approved Michigan's first educational strategic plan the top 10 and 10 plan. Then in 2020, you significantly improved it. Your leadership is critical so that all of the state's education stakeholders can be working together towards one unified vision and set of goals and targets. While your, pl while you your plan is in place, the responsibility of implementing it primarily falls on local school districts, boards of education, and the 890 school districts and ISDs. They are your boots on the ground. They are the ones empowered to make the vision, goals, and targets that you set a reality. Every local school board should have its own strategic plan that aligns with yours, uh, integrating, integrated with MyKIP, which determines the best strategies needed to accomplish those local plans. It is then that board's responsibility and that board's responsibility alone to hold itself and its superintendent accountable to achieving its and hopefully your strategic plans, vision, goals, and targets. At Michigan Association of School Boards annual leadership conference held last month, the following resolution was passed overwhelmingly. It is G 3.80, strategic plan, goals, and accountability. The Michigan Association School Board strongly recommends that local school boards of education develop, approve, and implement district goals and a strategic plan. The plan should align with that adopted by the State Board of Education. Aligning these plans and goals will help to make them both successful. A strategic plan empowers the school districts to plan for continuous change. It is used to communicate with the entire school community the board's vision for the district goals making that vision a reality, and the actions needed to achieve those goals. The plan should also include related support materials such as timelines and measurements. The board should work to hold itself and the district accountable to follow the strategic plan in achieving those established goals. With this commitment by the state's school board association, I look forward to working with this board of education and the Michigan Department of Education to assist in any way that I can to help you in aligning these plans, which is, the, uh, which is a necessary step toward achieving your vision of making Michigan a top 10 education state in the country. Thank you. We will now go to virtual public comment. If the first caller could be let in, please. Is the caller in? Hello? Is there a caller on the line? Yes, I am. If you could please state your name, where you're calling from, and then provide your comments, I will keep a three-minute timer. 
If you have the board meeting on in the background, if you could turn that off, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Renita Bonides from Midland. I am spoke last month about the MASB and the concerns I have for the fact that this nonprofit organization is giving a lot of direction to our school boards. Um, the elected officials that we have are looking to them for guidance. However, they are putting in policy recommendations that are actually working against the parents in the community. And I think in terms of the way the National Association of School Boards has operated, that schools should be distancing themselves from these organizations and no longer funding them, but instead working with the community and the parents and the state level in order to help determine the policies to work through. Also, we are having concerns that the school board, um, in ours in particular, that we're having trouble with the Open Meeting Act and the fact that subcommittees are being set up with less than a quorum in order to avoid the Open Meeting Act, and therefore the business that is taking place during the meetings is simply a vote on something that was discussed behind closed doors in private, which is against the Open Meeting Act. And this has been brought up and defended by them. We also are having trouble with the bylaws being broken month after month with no sense that we need to hold them accountable that they continue to do that. And further, their oaths that they took to the Constitution and also to faithfully discharge the duties of the office are also not being followed as part of discharging their duties would be to follow their bylaws, and that is not taking place. And in order to hold any of them accountable, it seems the only recourse schools, parents, and community have is to hire lawyers and to go after them from a legal standpoint. And recalls are having difficulties, and I don't understand a system that requires us to bring in lawyers in order to deal with our elected officials at the local level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller, please. Do we have a caller on the line? Is there someone on the line? Uh, yes, hello. This is uh, Katie McFarland from the Oakland County area. Uh, first of all, I'd like to second everything that the woman from Midland just called in and spoke <laughs> about. Um, it was very um, well said, and I agree wholeheartedly with everything she had to say. Um, in terms of the social and emotional learning, you know, faith, family, and friendships, these are the cornerstones for every child's social and emotional well-being. Uh, it, it is not the job of a government institution to, uh, to ensure social and emotional well-being of a child. It is the right of parents to teach their children morals, values, attitudes, and beliefs. Uh, social and emotional learning, it pushes children into a group think box. You know, that's not what America is about. Uh, when children go to school, they're there for academics. We have transitioned the purpose of education from academics to a very radical ideology. Uh, you know, just to quote Thomas Sowell, emotions neither prove nor disprove facts. There was a time when any rational adult understood this, but years of dumbed-down education and emphasis on how people feel have left too many people unable to see through this media gimmick. You know, in terms of equity, here, here's the thing. The problem is we have replaced we have replaced God with government, with equity, with social justice, all of these things that are just indoctrinating our kids. Uh, I just read an article regarding equity. <laughs> I, I read that uh, large California school districts have eliminated D and F grades. Well, this is what equity looks looks like. Meritocracy is dead and mediocrity is praised. You know, kids need to be challenged and experience failure to help them work harder and grow. This equal outcome push in equity is unrealistic and harmful. We also need to eliminate the restorative justice practices that are extremely harmful. Kid, kids need to be held to account for bad behavior. Uh, and that these are very harmful practices that need to be eliminated from the public school system. 
Um, you know, there's also been uh, pornographic material that I know we have been finding in my local school district in these libraries. I understand that most states have exempted school librarians from obscenity laws, and boy, does that need to change. Kids have a right to their own dignity and innocence. We as adults need to protect that innocence for as long as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. You know, it should be to be challenged and experience failure to help them work Hello, caller. If you could please mute the meeting in the background, that'd be helpful. Thanks. Please state your name, where you're from, and provide your three minutes of comments. I'll keep a timer here. Thank you for calling. Thank you very much. My name is Stephanie Margulai, and I'm from Troy, Michigan. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, the curriculum, the SEL, that I'm opposed to. Um, this curriculum, when as part of an outer system, um, all examples of families used are negative and elicit negative emotions. Sorry. Um, the curriculum is systemically designed to get children to rely on the school and not their families. Um, this shows up in their um, this shows up in their own chart that they have. Um, students are often often um, I'm sorry. The SEL group that makes them feel named and motion. This leads to children revealing far more information than should be shared in a school setting, and it sets the teachers um, up as a counselor, and it's just out of the scope of training for teachers. You know, the curriculum also teaches the removal of personal autonomy starting in kindergarten. Children are given scenarios and asked what they should do. The correct answer is always in the curriculum, and it states to, for example, give a hug. Um, at no point in kindergarten through eighth grade, the curriculum is told, child is told to request anything they want may be denied or even more troubling, you know, that they may deny someone's request. It is about making demands of others. Um, sorry. Um, that students are expected to meet. Personal responsibility are principles that are lacking in this curriculum. Um, children are often divided. A line is drawn down the center of the classroom, often with tape, and children are asked to identify one group or the other. This is used in lessons, often separating into groups. It's also a tactic commonly used in CRT. Um, SEL is the mechanism for getting CRT into the classroom. They state they are rooted in equity, and their goal is to achieve social justice. This is CRT verbiage. One lesson starts out by telling students that their experiences are different than parents and grandparents and they can't relate. This is a common CRT narrative that lived experience is more important than history. Um, it's clear SEL is driving peer orientation and <clears throat> it has children looking to their peers instead of their parents. I mean, I've learned all this information I'm sharing by parents who have taken many, many hours to study the entire second step caseful SEL curriculum. It's clearly up to us parents who oppose these tactics and goals to speak up and get caseful removed from our schools. The program is rotten to its core and it needs to be removed entirely. The biggest way parents can help is to opt their children out. We need a new design. Ma I'm sorry, your time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling. Next caller, please. Those are all the callers in the lobby. Okay, this concludes public participation. Thank you. Thank you to all those of uh, our public participants this afternoon. We appreciate their sharing. It's important that the board and community hear from you. We're now going to pivot back to the last presentation that was slated for this morning. That presentation, the presentation on Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan goal number two, to improve early literacy achievement. During this presentation, 
will share information on the second goal of the state's top 10 strategic education plan. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. Our presenters, we welcome uh, Dr. Delsa Chapman, our Deputy Superintendent of Educator, Student, and School Support, Dr. Paula Daniel, our Director of Educational Support, and Ms. Shelley Probstall, Manager of the Literacy Unit. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Presenters, welcome. We appreciate your forbearance and you coming back to educate us this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Good afternoon, Board of Education. We reiterate today the eight goals of our strategic education plan, but in particular, as you see bolded, our focus today is goal two, improve early literacy achievement. Our intent is to share the recent efforts of the MDE literacy team specific to improving early literacy. We all know that metrics matter and must be strategically addressed with intentional strategies to support both educators and students. We will update you on the seven points noted here in relation to what we have accomplished in these areas and the next steps moving forward. The first point that we will focus on today are the literacy essentials. To support the early literacy goal, we must expand the knowledge of literacy development and literacy learning for those who contribute to early literacy learner outcomes. All early literacy educators are encouraged to understand and use the Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators, MAISA, the General Education Leadership Network, GELN, and the Early Literacy Task Force, ELTF, Essential Instructional Practices in Early Literacy, also known as the Literacy Essentials, which are research-proven, effective approaches to markedly improved literacy skills among Michigan students. The Essentials, found at literacyessentials.org, help our educators increase Michigan's capacity to improve children's literacy by identifying a set of research-supported instructional practices that have a positive influence on literacy development. The essentials are just that. They are the foundation. Our next steps are to reach out and ensure that practices include opportunities for students to engage in the text, become excited about what they read and learn, we want to provide opportunities to explore their interests, motivate them in reading and writing, and support those students with the most persistent literacy needs. Other work to support the literacy achievement includes literacy coaches, parents and community literacy, and diverse classroom libraries. Dr. Daniels, to my left, will now share information on our diversity in literacy efforts. A leader in multicultural children's literature, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop notes that children should see themselves in their literature, mirrors, see others in their literature, windows, and be able to experience others' worlds in their literature, the sliding doors. Diversity in literature and in the materials we use help ensure that all the students we serve see a reflection, recognition, and respect for the many cultures they represent. This experience gives them an opportunity to see themselves in the words they read and the pictures they view, which can be all that's needed to encourage a reluctant reader to venture out into the text and find meaning, enjoyment, and new levels of success in reading. Diversity in literature can help students explore and celebrate new cultures and experiences that can lead to a broader, richer understanding of the world in which we all live. The MDE continues to create a multitude of resources Michigan educators may use to help bring more diversity to their classrooms. 
MDE resources to facilitate diversity in literature and diverse classroom libraries have included the 2021 Equity and Literacy Guidance Document that provides a layer of foundation for educators in the why and how to incorporate equity and literacy within the classroom. In addition, the MDE, with the aid of the educational field and the Library of Michigan, worked to compile a living authors of color and their great works document. Because of the role of diversity in the literature that we teach is at the forefront of the literacy of our education goals. A celebration of authors calendar that featured recommendation from Michigan educators was shared during Black History Month last February. MDE also held a diversity and literacy conference featuring Dr. Goldie Muhammad in February 2021. This reinforced the foundation being laid with our educators regarding diversity in literacy. In addition, one of our partners, the Michigan Association for Media and Education, MAME, our librarian partners, has put forth a myriad of resources for educators to use. The role of diversity within the literature that we teach webinar series as a noted key factor in developing and supporting a lifelong love of reading is ensuring that all children are engaged and see themselves in the literature that reflects their lives and the world's diversity. One of the ways MDE is providing learning opportunities for educators to increase their knowledge on ways to support diversity in the literature in their classrooms is by hosting the role of diversity within the literature we teach webinar series. The series lifts the thoughts of authors on the benefits of and various ways to inclu include diverse literature in the classroom. Author and professor Nikki Giovanni presented in October and author Shauna Buchanan will be with us in January. Her background embodies diversity as a descendant of African nations, the Kohari and Choctaw and Eastern Band of Cherokee nations and Europeans. Additional sessions will be scheduled in April and July. February will mark, mark the first anniversary of our compendium of Authors of Color book list. The list includes authors of color from many backgrounds and can be added to the authors and books that have historically graced our libraries and classroom bookshelves. These authors from diverse backgrounds bring different experiences to life, providing new opportunities to gain understanding of all people in our world. Contributors to the list included the Library of Michigan, Michigan Department of Education, and the Confederation of Michigan Tribal Education Directors and Librarians. We continue to support ways to strengthen and celebrate reading for all Michigan students. Next, Ms. Prospel will share additional information on our literacy efforts. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, MDE was awarded a federal grant totaling nearly 16 million over a five-year period. The grant is to assist districts with creating a birth to grade 12 comprehensive literacy plan. Five districts were awarded to a to work with the department and other statewide literacy partners. The districts include Benton Harbor, Pontiac, Muskegon Heights, Detroit, and Flint. The districts have completed the first year of the grant and all have reported strengthening their local literacy plans by implementing innovative programs such as professional lear learning, tutoring systems, and building disciplinary literacy six through 12 and in interventions. In the first year, there were common activities in which all recipients participated in. Each district was appointed a comprehensive literacy facilitator to, facilitator to centralize the process of building a comprehensive birth to grade 12 literacy system. This individual collaborates with each of the literacy stakeholders in their district with MDE and with other facilitators to network and build community among grant recipients. This grant requires funds to be allocated among three age grade bands, birth to kindergarten entry, 
kindergarten through grade five and six through 12. Each district created goals for these categories to define what they plan to accomplish during the grant term. Each district conducted an internal needs assessment to identify areas of focus throughout the grant term. Taking the information from the needs assessment together with the goals, each district prioritized the work across the five years and developed a plan of action to accomplish the goals. Since each district was at a different place when they received the grant, each district's plan is unique. Districts are partnering with four organizations through this grant, including MESA, GELN, Early Literacy Task Force, for training in the Literacy Essential Practices, Too Small to Fail for the Talking is Teaching Program, the Michigan Education Corps for Pre-K Reading Corps and K-3 Reading Corps, and the Michigan MTSS Technical Assistance Center for training and developing district-wide systems. Letters, which is language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, and elementary and secondary interventions. Based on the needs assessment, districts were able to focus on efforts identified as specific to their needs. These are just some of the highlights from their plans. Benton Harbor invested in professional learning for letters, Orton Gillingham, and they're partnering with the Great Start Collaborative. Detroit continued with professional learning in BrainSpring, Orton Gillingham, letters, and disciplinary literacy. Flint created a district-wide literacy team, a cradle school, and professional learning for grades six to 12 disciplinary literacy. Muskegon Heights created summer cohorts for letters training to continue throughout the year, began rewards training, and partnered with Goldie Muhammad to create diverse classroom libraries and lesson plans. Pontiac is participating in literacy essential training with a focus on writing for pre-K, K-3, and 4-5. They provided preschool literacy intervention assistance and also invested in secondary literacy coaching. Like I said, this is not an exhaustive list. It re represents just some of the efforts from the CLSD districts. Districts are offered many opportunities to monitor their progress toward the student performance goals. They are providing monthly status updates, participating in communities of practice, and meeting with MDE monthly, if not more, to be a thought partner in this process. MDE is pleased to join with these five districts as they continue to work to improve student literacy performance. To support the early literacy goal, MDE announced October 28, 2021, the Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling Training, grant for pre-K to grade three educators. This grant is included in section 35A of the State School Aid Adopted Act under Public Act 48, 2021. Developed by Dr. Louisa Motes and leaders in the field of literacy, letters teaches the skills needed to master the foundational and fundamentals of reading and writing instruction. Phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, and written language. Letters is an excellent investment in further developing teachers' language and literacy ex expertise to understand why reading is complex, the source of reading difficulties, and how to successfully teach all students, including those with significant and persistent literacy-related needs. Accelerated learning was once considered a means to support advanced learners only. Accelerated learning strategies, however, keep all students moving in on their intended targets. By strategically preparing them for success in current grade level content, acceleration focuses on teaching only what must be learned at a given level instead of trying to teach everything that a student did not learn in the previous grade or grades. Acceleration requires teachers to identify crucial content that they need to teach and that students need to learn so that the students can access current grade level material. As part of MDE's accelerated learning support to Michigan districts, there has been a focus on early literacy supports for educators and district staff. The accelerated learning guidance that the MDE provides Michigan educators includes educator guidance documents, state and national presenters for literacy learning through webinar series, essential skills for literacy standards and content, and relaying to educators that the focus on tier one grade level instruction is integral 
in accelerated learning processes. The Michigan Department of Education hosted the free virtual conference for pre-K through grade six educators and administrators, building the literacy path from home to school and school to home on November 10th, 2021. The keynote speaker, Dr. Patricia Edwards, provided school leaders and classroom teachers with new and creative ways to welcome, encourage, and engage parents in literacy. Our own teacher of the year, Leah Porter, was a special guest speaker. Attendees received information on ways to build the home to school partnerships and knowing that they are essential when student uh, success is a desired outcome. Lastly, MDE is developing guidance for educators to improve literacy outcomes for all learners including those exhibiting characteristics of dyslexia. MDE has an, has an internal work group which is meeting weekly to develop a guidance document draft for the field. The next steps will be collecting feedback and revision of the guidance prior to distribution to local school districts. And we would like to say thank you for this opportunity to share with you today as we continue to strive in increasing early, early literacy achievement, the second goal of our state strategic education plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, presenters. We appreciate your, your sharing. Uh, board members, questions or comments? Questions or comments from board members? Oh, um, Dr. Pugh, okay. to you. I didn't yes. know if I was jumping in front of anyone. So, um, in, Thank you um, for the presentation. Some of, um, I'm just wondering, how are the communities involved in the, in the grant program? Because I've heard from some of the folks within those communities and they're just wondering like some of the things that can be done around literacy. And I'm wondering if they know that this work is going on. I'm thinking that, I, I'm pretty sure that they don't, but is there a way that these communities can allow uh, um, the communities to, do, to know? So one of the ways, especially with the talking is teaching, um, they have trusted advisors that actually help um, parents um, learn language and that, that early importance of talking to infants um, and developing language. And that is, um, that is working through the Great Start Collaborative, so which they have very strong community uh, connections as well. Um, and that's in the early, earlier years. Part of our, part of our um, communities of practice is um, we kind of have, we, we've taken, I think what you've said is really important, um, the needs of the schools and listen to them. And that is a topic that they are delving into. And that is um, the reason why we had Dr. Edwards do a family engagement um, learning opportunity as well. And we will continue to look at ways to, to really make those connections for school districts and parents, um, because we know that that's where the learning starts first. Okay. And in this, this particular instance, I mean, we get questions about this around literacy, you know, what are we doing? But in this particular in, in, uh, instance, it was faith-based. So just wondering how people who want to provide wraparound support, mm -hmm. that they know that, that this work is going on and maybe that they get a, some sort of uh, indication on how they can, can provide uh, support in this area. Dr. Pugh, that's an excellent question. And now that the foundation has been set with the grant, that is part of phase two as we move forward, looking very closely at the outcomes of the assessments that were completed by those districts, as well as what we know here at the department is going to be a best fit scenario for spreading and reaching out broadly that community focus is that next layer. So we are now looking at ideas of how we can approach and include the community in various efforts. Thank you. And specifically, Dr. Pugh, to your question, the faith-based community. Mm -hmm. We have begun that conversation with individual faith-based leaders. We are working to figure out how to feather out a faith-based effort across the state. There's a value to it. Okay. We have pastors who are in this space already they would welcome being a part of something larger than simply in their own in their right. own uh, faith-based community or recreate or creating something that you know they could be a part of this so. no question yep there's no question about that thank you 
Um, other questions or comments from uh, state board members? Or from our teacher of the year? Uh, we've got uh, Ms. Lipton, who is uh, doing the, uh, the state board royal wave. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if someone could uh, let us know what the, um, if you do know, what the unmet need might be. Usually we grant proposals. Um, I assume that uh, the department, like most granting um, agencies, have to pick from applications, but could you give us a sense of uh, what the unmet need might be um, in, your ex in your opinion and what that uh, dollar figure might look like, if you can? So, so can, we just, can we just talk to the fact that uh, the, the number of, let's back up. I think, Ms. Lipton, you're referring to the federal grant. That, that federal grant for which we initially applied was a competitive grant. We, that is to say the SEA, the State Education Agency, won that grant. Part of that grant application that we submitted to the feds that we were awarded uh, funds for was to uh, have a competition within the state of uh, high needs districts that had a, uh, a requirement to create stronger literacy communities. And so we had quite a few that showed initial interest, um, but the requirements, it seems to me, were drawn pretty tightly, if I recall correctly, Dr. Daniels and Ms. Probstall. Dr. Chapman, that predates you with the department. <laughs> But it seems to me that dozens of districts across the state expressed an interest in being a part of. But we made the determination at the state level to serve only those communities of perceived greatest need as measured by socioeconomic status, number one, as measured by literacy rates, number two. And so a smaller number ultimately ended up applying, but we had dozens of districts that expressed an interest in being a part of this literacy work. So you could easily peg the value of the, of the unmet grant need in low nine figures. In terms of literacy supports across the state, you could easily go into the high nine figures, into the 10 figures, because what you're doing is you're talking about addressing the absence um, in so many cases, reducing class sizes, particularly in early elementary, where teachers are teaching the fundamentals of reading and writing and numeracy, working on supports, tutoring, mentoring at early, early ages, and, and working to create a foundation. Once children read, the question is, do they continue to read? It's that foundation we're looking to put into place initially, and then subsequently the engagement in reading that we're looking for. When Dr. Daniels spoke about diversity, it's not diversity for diversity's sake, although certainly our children uh, should see themselves periodically in their literature. All of our children should see themselves periodically in our literature, not just some of our children. But it's not diversity for diversity's sake. It's diversity for the sake of engagement. Engagement for the sake of higher uh, uh, amounts of reading, number one. Greater fluency, number two. Greater vocabulary development, number three. And by extension, greater knowledge development, number four, which becomes prior knowledge as you approach each fresh text. And ultimately, collectively, leads to higher comprehension. So um, to your question, from a grant perspective, low nine figures. From the perspective of supports in schools, I would say high nine figures into 10 figures. And, and by the way, I might add that squares well with the, uh, the research of six studies in six years that talk about the underfunding of public education in the state 
which peg that number depending upon whether you include capital needs, transportation needs, and high poverty needs, which peg that number between five and seven billion dollars. Thank you. Um, other questions or com thank you, Ms. Lipton. Other questions or comments from board members? Um, hearing and seeing. No, oh, I beg your pardon, Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, there's no question that early literacy can make all the difference. And I appreciate the connection to the families because we know that if it can be reinforced at home, um, then we see more gained. I just, and I think it's been clarified, but I just wanted to clarify that while you focused in on giving us a report on the grant and where we're at currently with that, and you talked about MAISA and GELN, et cetera, that all districts in the state of Michigan are trying to focus their efforts um, on early literacy uh, and provide that training as they can uh, for, all, for teachers um, within the elementary uh, level uh, and pre-K. Um, the um, kind of uh, connection with GSRP uh, so that students are better prepared when they enter kindergarten. So I guess that was more of a comment than a question because you're all <laughs> nodding your head. So. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. We're the choir. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Pritchett. I, I think you, uh, you and other board members have, have earned your, uh, your moment. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate the presentation. Um, we appreciate your continued work to help raise up our children in literacy. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Board members, the next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is the presentation of the 50th anniversary of Michigan Mandatory Special Education. I've been waiting 50 years to say that. <laughs> I likely won't get to say it again in 50 years. Welcome, welcome, welcome. These are our special education warriors. We're going to wait until everybody gets in the room. Please tell the guy who flew in from Hawaii. <laughs> Board members and community members, good afternoon yeah. again. The next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is presentation of the 50th anniversary of Michigan Mandatory Special Education. Today we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Michigan Mandatory Education. Michigan was a leader in the nation as state special education law was passed in 1971, well before the federal special education law, public law 94, 142, the Education for All Handicapped Act was passed in and signed into law in 1975. Presenters will share history and information on special education law. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. We welcome our presenters, Dr. Scott Kennigschneck, who was young in 1971, <laughs> tenant of P20 System and Student Transitions, uh, Ms. Terry Rink, who was likewise young in 1971, the Director of the Office of Special Education. Dr. Noel Kelty, Director of the Office of Early Childhood Development and Family Education. Mr. Lynn Beekman, who was uh, similarly young in 1971, as most of us were, if we were even around in 1971. <laughs> uh, Head of Special Education Solutions, LLC. Dr. Charles Mange, Professor Emeritus and Mr. Harvey Zuckerberg, the Executive Director of ARC Michigan, now retired. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. 
Presenters, welcome. We have been waiting for you for the last five decades. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Rice, and thank you to the board for allowing us to spend some time um, this afternoon celebrating. Um, I think it's appropriate in the midst of this holiday season, uh, where we stop and celebrate many things, um, for us to stop and celebrate the 50th anniversary of Michigan Mandatory Special Education. As Dr. Rice had said, um, I'm joined at the table by Terry Rink uh, and Dr. Noel Kelty. We've, we've presented before, but the three gentlemen on the left uh, are new to the table. Um, as Dr. Rice had says, Lynn, Lynn Beekman from Special Education Solutions, uh, Dr. Chuck Charlie Mange, uh, Professor Emeritus, and Harvey Zuckerberg, um, the retired executive director um, at the ARC Michigan. All of us, I think, have heard the term um, standing on the shoulders of giants. And today, we are very fortunate to be in the midst of them, as all three of these gentlemen played a pivotal role in the petition that would later become law that required mandatory special education services for students in the state of Michigan. Um, and shortly, they're going to tell their story. Um, but what I'd like to do is provide a little history and a little context before that. Certainly um, hear from these gentlemen um, in terms of how this happened, uh, and then we'll finish the presentation with Dr. Kelty and uh, Ms. Rink sharing some testimonials from parents because we know um, this is about children uh, and parents. So a little bit of the history. Um, the law that transpired in uh, 1971 was known as Public Act 198, and again, this required mandatory special education services in the state of Michigan, and that may not seem like a big deal, um, but it was for a couple of reasons. As Dr. Rice alluded to the fact this was four years prior to the federal law. Um, and in Michigan, it required services from birth to 26. And many of us in the room know that Michigan is the only state that provides services to 26. And we're only one of five states that provide services from birth to three. Um, and so these three gentlemen um, and many of their colleagues were visionaries in terms of um, crafting the petition that would become legislation knowing uh, the needs of the families and the children in the state of Michigan. The law also allowed the superintendent of instruction to promulgate rules. Those rules are known as MARS rules. They've developed over the years. There are over about 125 of them. We're not going to go through all of them. Um, but they really outline how the law is implemented um, in the state of Michigan. And I did include a couple of them. Um, in terms of their noteworthiness, one of the rules requires ISDs to have parent advisory committees, so the voice of that parent and those parents in those communities are heard, um, as well as requiring ISDs to sub, uh, submit a comprehensive plan in terms of how they're going to do business at that, uh, I'll say, local ISD level. Um, and so those are just a couple of the noteworthy Mars rules. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Lynn Beekman, and Lynn is going to be uh, begin telling us uh, the story. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the members of the board, uh, Dr. Rice, Dr. K-13, as I've come to know him over the years, and uh, the many other members of the department who uh, helped in putting this celebration together. I would also want to acknowledge a few old folks who were special letters back at the time uh, mandatory came in, but who could not make it here today, but they are watching virtually of this meeting. Uh, first would be Tom Howard, who was an important member of my dad's staff when he was state director of special ed in 1967. Uh, uh, Harold Spinknell, who was also a member of his staff and later a sta the state director. Uh, and finally, Ed Birch, who was a state director throughout most of the decade of the 80s. And so those gentlemen are participating uh, by long distance. I want to explain a little bit how I got involved in mandatory coming about, because it's kind of a different story. As I mentioned, my dad, Marv Beekman, was appointed state director in May of 1967. He and others, including Charlie and Harvey, had tried uh, to get mandatory through the legislature, but quite frankly, without success. And about that time, parents in many states throughout the country were suing to try and get court-ordered special ed. And they were doing so on the basis of the primary holding of Brown versus Board of Education, equal protection. And my dad used to say in his usual direct fashion, you pay your tax dollars to educate all children, including those who are handicapped. He thought it was absolutely nuts that you paid tax dollars and you didn't educate all the children. 
Well, in May of 1968, I became a lawyer. My dad hated lawyers. He thought they were all shysters. One strike against them. So then I had the temerity to join the large firm in Lansing that represented the Michigan Education Association, and I did some of their work. He did not like teacher unions, to put it mildly. Two strikes against me. In October of 1968, he invited me to go with him to a meeting in Oakland County where a lawyer was going to talk to parents about suing for mandatory. I felt with two strikes against me to redeem myself in his eyes, I had to say yes, and I did. But it was the most consequential response I have ever made in my life, with the possible exception of saying I do to my wife 56 <laughs> years ago. So on the ride home, my dad and I are talking about the meeting, and I, he says, you know, I think that lawyer was kind of sleazy, and I said, well, I kind of agree with you. And, and I said, hey, Pa, what about uh, maybe an initiative petition? I mean, who the heck would not sign an initiative petition to educate handicapped kids? That was the language of the day. He liked the idea. So he called up his old buddy, Charlie Mains, to my right, and he said, why don't you and Charlie draft the language in the petition? which we did. And Scott will pass out copies of the petition. I used to have 10,000. I'm now down to only about 1,000, but I'm going to share a copy with you. <laughs> and he called up his other party, Harvey Zuckerberg. Harvey then was the head of uh, the Michigan Association of Retarded Citizens, now known as ARC. And uh, Harvey was a go-getter, to say the least, and he was in charge of getting the 250,000 signatures to put it on the petition as well as dealing with our friends over in the legislature. And at that point, I'm going to turn it over to those two guys because they did most of the real work in getting it passed. Thanks, Lynn, and thanks to the board and all those who made this possible. Because it, for me, we're not here to debate anything. We're here to celebrate so we don't have to argue we're, we have a common cause, and that feels good to be with all you good folks who are here for that reason. There are, uh, you made an interesting comment about uh, something that happened before. Uh, I may remember, try to work that into what I want to say. But I would like to say, first of all, that there are a number of people, especially in my own family, who are so interwoven in this whole story, in the whole picture that I want to recognize some of them. And the first person is Kelly of the After 26 uh, Depot Cafe present day. I'm sorry. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Many of you are familiar with it. It's in Cadillac. And it provides some opportunities for handicapped persons to learn uh, some skills that were useful for them. And one of my members saying to me, I just love to come to work here. And he did, he wanted to let his story know, be known. But that's, again, this is a facility that goes beyond the age of 25 to, and 26 now, and has been in operation since 2013, if I receive their uh, their, their ad on the internet. This is uh, another one that is a, something I want to cite, and this is a Linda Ventole, who is the director of the Northwood Academy. Again, serving children who have a reason to want to learn and who have the opportunity by enriching their lives in new things. And she is now the recently appointed executive director. She's there. And I'd like to claim some other people that are here that I want to tell you about. There is a career teacher present with us here, happened to be my sister-in-law, who loved every child she ever saw and ever knew. And that's not an overstatement at all. She devoted her career in teaching at the kindergarten and elementary levels. And 
She is a beloved part of my family as well. And that she sits in there. She's one of those special people, like almost all of the people with special ed, that want to stay with that job, are special, caring people. That's why we're here. I have also, in the family, a teacher of, of the hearing law, uh, hearing and uh, hearing imp uh, impairments and deaf, has devoted her career to that. And she's a part of my family, my daughter-in-law. Yeah, there she is. There is another person that I wanted to mention. That was to be my niece who is here and she is truly handicapped, literally and figuratively. She earned an RN degree with her handicap and practiced as an RN for several years until she determined that she would like to do something else with a group of young people in Southeast Asia. And she spent many years there teaching women in Southeast Asia how to be midwives. Facilities, medical facilities, not there very in abundance in any case. But she devoted her life to that. I also have here present today, uh, came in from Hawaii yesterday, that's going back tomorrow, uh, and my youngest son, Jim, and uh, by the way, if, if you get there to Hawaii, uh, you might want to find him because he does kayak tours. <laughs> and his wife, by the way, uh, is also a physician, and she is the daughter of two parents, father and mother, who were physicians in Nigeria for at least seven years. And she lived there for seven years before she came to the US. But the other thing I want to say about them is such special. I've never really acknowledged there's anything publicly about this. They wanted to adopt a child because they were going to be childless. And they were very young. and. Uh, they were on a, lot, a list of people to be, that they could, might, might be able to adopt. And it was a long list and said, we can't wait that long. And all of a sudden, the next day after they said that, they said there was a handicapped child that needed somebody. That child would, had a bilateral cleft, lip and palate. It couldn't be fed well at the risk of asphyxiating because it would go into the lungs instead of the esophagus and they adopted that child and that child uh, there's another one too there was a young girl baby and they wanted another one and they found that there was another one available and they said handicapped or not it's okay we would we, we like that the girl came young girl no handicaps she is and both of them now are living normal adult lives. The one with a handicap and the one regular. And they are, excuse me. We've got to get going. That's one. We've got to move. <laughs> got to move. Uh, enjoying the story. Well, I'm, I'm, right, I'm right at the end of these introductions. All right, you guys. All right. <laughs> I hate to, hate to hear him say that you've got to have a movement. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass that up too. All right. No, there's another person I want to mention, a special friend of ours, and uh, who became uh, part of our circle at MSU, and this Jackie Babcock, and she's a very special person. She's here also. But I also have to introduce one more person, and that is, he's not here, he's an absentia. He had the good sense to pass on genes with his mother to this <laughs> fellow here. And uh, he also was the guy, as mentioned before, he told us that everybody that could profit from education ought to have access to the usage of the money of those votes and the, the, and the facilities. He said that many times, and we began to understand what he meant, and he also showed us how to do it. And that was Marv Beekman, 
who received an honorary doctorate from MSU at the same time Van Cliburn did. Two worthy artists, but in different fields. And so we owe, if we owe anything as a father, as a stimulus for this whole business, it was Mark Beekman. I want to quickly move to other things because I'm being <laughs> being a little bit long-winded. <laughs> Professors do that. And you wonder how I got into this. Well, I got into it in part because it was an accident. We went to visit uh, at the end of my fourth year of faculty member at Syracuse University. We went to Kalamazoo, visited our widowed uh, parents, and also saw the Mackinac Bridge uh, as a part of it. I was ready to go back to Syracuse to resume my job. And there was an article in the Kalamazoo Gazette talking about millages and plans to do something with special ed to expand. And I thought, that's an interesting thing. I didn't really know much about that. And I stopped the next morning, checked with the superintendent there, and he said, come to my board meeting tonight. We happen to have one. Come to people to exchange some ideas about how we could do this. And I did. And I went, figured something else is going to happen. Nothing. They're going to do, interview some people to try and do that. 10 o'clock in the evening, I got a telegram. Uh, they offered me the job as director of special ed and to develop the program at a salary two grand in excess of what I was going to earn at uh, Syracuse. And at that time, two grand was t grand. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I said, if I can arrange things with Syracuse University so I don't put them in a bind, I'll be there. And it took a couple of weeks, but we arranged things at Syracuse. I came to Almazoo in a tremendously beneficial, interesting experience because all of those people in the in this 11 or 12 constituent districts of the, Ingham, uh, the Kalamazoo area were very cooperative. And they arranged and they participated, including some parent involvement in working about how we're going to do this thing it was done. The problem was then that we had the next problem of how uh, they had these laws that were introduced that never went anywhere. We got to do something about it. So Mark Beekman called me, said, we got to come down to the, get your gravel bag lunch. Come on, we got to go down for the Capitol and make, it, make a meeting. Okay, we went there, we sat up in the balcony overlooking the House and Senate floor, and I think we met with Lucille McCullough, if I remember correctly, the chairman of the House Education Committee. And we talked about what should be done. The uh, great solution came quickly. We should ask to get past the law to make an actual count of those that we think are unserved or underserved. That was done. It made it because it was no expenditure on the part of the education department or the state. At that point, all the counts were made by the intermediate and the local districts. The data came back, yes, it was apparent that there was a significant need for more. And so Lynn and I were the ones that were designated, and he told us how that happened. I am never sure. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we did. We sat down there. My job was easy. It was, it was not a heavy lifting job because I had gone through all this stuff before and I knew how an administration, administration could be developed here that we could, could accomplish this because we had done it. And so the next problem was, after we talked to all of the things, we better get a law ready because it's, it's going to be another legislative session. We've got to get something going. We sat kitchen table, talked a little bit. What do we want to put into that thing? And he'd go, he'd go back and... Uh, uh, work out some language and they'd come back and we'd tinker with it a little bit. Didn't have to do much tinkering. And we finally had a bill that was proposed that he put together. And one of the things that had to be, it had to be mandatory. Everybody had to participate. And it also had, there was no tuition. We're going to use the funds that were voted various places, plus the state aid that already existed for categories. And we added one more thing that was very significant beside that age group. We wanted to have 
a, some kind of a statement of quality of what the program is. Not just you're going to have a program, but what are you going to have in it? And we ended up with a term, programs designed to develop the maximum potential of each student. We couldn't define it, <laughs> and we don't have to. On the other hand, the adjudication that's gone on, I have some concerns about that. But the cost of that, I think some, something may happen yet in the future to try and ease that particular cost. Well, the next problem was the heavy lifter. He took all of the school code, all the sections, hundreds of them, some be amended, deleted, added, massaged, otherwise as only a attorney can do it. <laughs> and he organized them by number and title and so forth and made a cohesive block of education law that became this act that we're celebrating. That was the heavy lifting. No one in the, that I ever know could have done what Lynn did so quickly and so expertly. His father is the father of it, and Lynn is the first heavy lifter in the production of it. But then we had this. Now the question is, we have the law. What can we do to do something about getting it enacted? And I pass my pass the, the gavel, I pass the term to the heavy lifter, Harvey Zuckerberg. It's your turn. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, board members and uh, Dr. Rice. Dr. K, Koenigsnacht, <laughs> and <laughs> Dr. Rink, uh, we appreciate it very much. Um, I'm going to be very brief, five minutes to six minutes, and uh, Lynn got me out of mothballs. Uh, my shoes are hard. I haven't worn hard shoes in 10 years, so <laughs> if you see a pained expression on my face, uh, take no offense. It's not us. There, there is a, I'm wearing jeans, by the way. Again, take no offense. My, my suits don't fit anymore. I couldn't close the fat button. Um, the strategy to gain, uh, to gather 250,000 signatures for an initiative petition to put the bill on, on the ballot uh, was part of a, a multifaceted campaign. We really had three prongs. Um, I have a little divergent memory as uh, 50 years of, of uh, the fog of war, if you will, uh, from uh, Linwood. Uh, I came from Illinois in 1970 and was told that, uh, and joined as executive director of the Michigan Association for Retarded Children, as it was known in those days. And uh, we had some uh, little success in Illinois. and. Uh, I think that the search committee took note of that, and Illinois' bill was nothing much. In fact, instead of shall provide, it wasn't mandatory. It says school districts may provide special education services. But when I arrived, these two had already developed an initiative petition. And uh, I was a lobbyist then, and, and I said, oh, don't do that. Uh, legislatures are jealous of their prerogative to uh, enact law. You're going to offend them and say, go collect your signatures if you can and see how you can do it. Uh, and I said, uh, and they said, no, it's Lynn put it, when Lynn puts his elbows on the table <laughs> and, and sticks his chin out, uh, we're going to have an initiative petition and my marching orders were to collect 250,000 signatures. <laughs> so uh, the war horse during the campaign to mandate special education opportunity for children and young adults with handicapping conditions was the organization then known as the MARC, Michigan Association for Retarded Children, regarded then as the parent movement in the field of mental retardation. I'm told that five previous attempts, at the time I was told when I arrived in, in Michigan, that five pre previous attempts to pass legislation failed until 1970, the organization had been constrained from practicing legislative advocacy on the principle that the matter should be held as nonpartisan uh, and nonpolitical. But uh, forgive the hyperbole, but when the ARC parents recognized that their children's rights demanded political action, 
it was like unleashing a tiger into the arena of public policy legislative advocacy. The ARC at the time was an organization of 10,000 families who were members of 67 chapters representing counties covering virtually every inch and almost uh, and most importantly, every elected official in the state. They chartered buses. They rallied at the Capitol. They met with their individual representatives and senators in their home districts. These families, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins, friends and neighbors were the ones who collected a quarter of a million signatures for a ballot proposal. So we had the initiative petition that my good friend Lynn Beekman and Chuck Mange said would be a lever, would be leveraged to force the legislative legislature to act rather than to do nothing. However, we introduced two bills. The, the uh, special education code as it was uh, drafted for the initiative petition was drafted by Lynn and Chuck into a statutory framework that we introduced as identical bills, one each in the Senate and one in the House. And the notion was that whichever bill gets any movement will ride that pony. <laughs> well, what happened was the, the, uh, the House was democratically controlled, the Senate was controlled by Republicans. The uh, sponsor for the House bill was Lucille McCullough, as Chuck mentioned. Uh, we met with Bobby Krim. Bobby Krim was then Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. and Bobby uh, said, uh, we're going to give it to Lucille, can't give it to anybody else. Lucille was chairman of the Education Committee, and she would call the office on a regular basis. Her staff would call, or she would call, and they'd say, uh, Lucille says, so-and-so, uh, member of, this, of the House, is giving us trouble. Call the ARC and tell them to do something about it. <laughs> so we would we would uh, call our ARC chapter that was a constituent of that uh, particular uh, representative. He would find out what the representative's uh, difficulties were and meet with them and apply their advocacy for support. Um, the, the Senate, on the other hand, uh, chose, and then we, we met with uh, Bobby's uh, counterpart in the Senate. Senate Majority Leader was Bob Vanderlaan, Republican. He said that he would take, take the bill too and gave it to Milt Zagman. And Milt Zagman sat on the bill. The Republicans said it was going to cost too damn much money. And we can't pass the bill as much as it's worthy, uh, but it's too expensive. Michigan can't afford it. So he gave it to Zagman, and Zagman sat on it. Well, Zagman was an undertaker, so we buried it. <laughs> and he was. He was an undertaker. So... Um, at the same time, the Michigan ARC recruited 25 statewide professional and trade and voluntary health organizations in a coalition to formally endorse the bills and enlist their members to advocate passage in the House and the Senate. Among these were the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, the Michigan Catholic Conference, the Michigan State Medical Society, just to name a few, the unions, all professional and trade associations, what have you, and importantly, their multi-client lobbying firms. And so any member of the, of the House who became reluctant, or the Senate, uh, had a uh, constituent uh, for whom that uh, representative was most fond. So for instance, if it was uh, uh, somebody from, uh, 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 known by the Mich Michigan Catholic Conference, Michigan Cath Catholic Conference would call Kent County and say, uh, call the Knights of Columbus down there, Harvey, and, and uh, call your chapter down there and have the Knights of Columbus reach out to this guy. He's a knight. And so he became a knight for special education. Uh, the Senate, uh, again, practiced benign neglect. Uh, there were no cri crippling amendments introduced. The Knights uh, it actually introduced a titular campaign and... Uh, uh, collected, uh, gave out Tootsie Rolls and raised, raised funds for us. Michigan Bankers Association uh, we met with and uh, asked them for their support. We said we needed money and uh, the bank, banks have money. And uh, I said, what can we do for you? And they said, we need pennies. 
I said, okay, we'll get you pennies. And so Tom Tucker, who was a president of the Michigan ARC, was a vice president for Campbell Ewald, uh, a prominent and prestigious advertising company in uh, Birmingham, but worked nationally. And Tom Ewald developed uh, point of sale counter displays at all the tellers' windows and banks throughout Michigan that said, help retarded children a penny for your thoughts. And of course, people put dollar bills in there too. So as it turned out, uh, uh, Governor Milliken signed the House bill into law on December 23rd, 1971. Lynn Beekman, a University of Michigan trained lawyer, Chuck Mange, professor of special education at Michigan State University. You talk about bipartisanship. Uh, and by the way, let me leap in for just a moment to mention that after their legislative careers, Bobby Krim, the most prominent and powerful Democratic politician in Michigan at the time, House Majority Leader, and Bob Vanderlaan, Senate Majority Leader, the top Republican leader in the state, went into business together for their, their own, with their own lobbying firm. So that kind of bipartisanship is difficult to find today. But uh, Lynn and Chuck, uh, in consultation with parents and key local special ed directors, and the guidance, guiding hand of uh, Marv Beekman, beloved state special education director, had given us a special education statutory mandate that served as a model for the nation. Further deponent saith not. <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen, for the history. We have a couple of videos that we would like to share. They're brief. I'm going to turn it over to Terry Rink, um, and we will uh, start off our first video. So this video was a collaborative effort with the Michigan Alliance for Families. They reached out to some of their um, families and asked if anybody would be willing <coughs> to share some of the benefits their children experience because of our services. So this is Dara. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dara. My son receives special services at school under Michigan Mandatory Special Education. He has an IEP for a learning disability in math, as well as attention deficit disorder. Because of his high distractibility and lack of staying on task and completing assignments, the resource teacher is able to pull him out of class and give him more individualized attention as well as help him complete assignments and complete testing. The social worker works with him on his social skills and appropriateness. Um, she has become one of our biggest advocates at school because she has taken the time to learn about my son and to know his character and his intentions. And she communicates that with the teachers and others so that when the situations arise, he is represented fairly. He also receives occupational therapy. And that came up when the school pointed it out to me. They thought that he needed further evaluation. I thought he didn't like to write and that's why um, he was having some of those issues, but then I remembered that he did have fine motor issues in preschool. So I was really appreciative of the staff recognizing his need for additional services. His occupational therapist is great, and the relationships that my son has formed with his special services team has been so beneficial to making um, him more academically successful and progressing along. I'm sure he'll need to continue some services as he transitions to high school. I'm looking forward to his transition IEP where he will become a part of the team and give his input on what he would like to do in the future after he leaves high school. Um, I I'm pretty sure that uh, he'll be as successful then as he is now, and I'm just very appreciative of special education and allowing my student to have additional services to to um, to ensure that he is successful academically. Thank you. And we should have one more video uh, that uh, Dr. Kelty is going to introduce. Okay, good. I was not sure which video we were going to pick, <laughs> so I was holding my breath. Yeah. So. Uh, Early intervention in the state of Michigan is called EARLY-M. That's the name of our early um, intervention program in Michigan. 
serving children who are um, infants and toddlers with delays and disabilities and their families. We serve about 21,000 children per year with our program and Michigan Mandatory Special Education is that layer to serve those children who need more services on top of the federal funds we receive for a Part C of the IDEA. So um, we're able to make a major impact. We are, as Dr. Kay mentioned, we are one of five birth mandate states, meaning that services begin at birth and that makes us unique and that gives every child in the state of Michigan that leg up in getting services sooner than they otherwise would so that we can prevent learning um, difficulties later. We can have more children being retained in school, um, more children doing well um, academically later in their school years. So this video here um, is, I think, about Nicholas. Yes, it's on the screen. And um, this is a family currently, that at the time of filming, was involved at that current time in early intervention, um, Michigan Mandatory Special Education Services. At his 15 month uh, well child, we knew that he wasn't really saying anything at that point and he should have had five to 10 words I think at that point. What I remember about that second visit then with the, with the second pediatrician was that uh, when she started talking about early on, she said, this is my favorite referral to make. Um, and she said, this is just, it makes her happy to refer people to early on because she believes in this program. Um, so that was kind of exciting to know that this was a really good thing and that it was going to take place in our home. Then the speech therapist came and tried to get him to make sounds and, and that's when I started to see like, oh man, he, he's not even making a lot of noises. He's not, you know, verbally responding, so. You know, obviously we're, we, we like to think of ourselves as good parents. We like to think of ourselves as doing everything that we can. Uh, but have we made some tragic error and, and, and as a result, our son is not speaking. <laughs> I think the, the common stigma or reputation about home visits is that the therapist is going to come in, she's, he or she is going to work with Nick for an hour, I'm going to observe, kind of take notes, try to do some of those things with Nick after they leave, and then, okay, see you next week. But we're a part of the parent intervention model, which is those home visits are really more for me than for Nick. It's a time where I'm interacting with Nick and and the therapist is stepping back and coaching me and encouraging me on how to work with Nicholas so that every day that I'm with Nick I know how to help him you know start to use his muscles and start to talk I'm his main therapist which has been incredible and if you think about it I mean it makes so much sense like we're doing the work and they're showing us how and it it's such a wonderful experience and to hear him have these victories and know that you were you did it with him is just wonderful yeah. <laughs> so. Well, that brings an end to our presentation. So I would like to thank the board for allowing us to, um, to share the story today. I would certainly like to sh uh, thank these three gentlemen for telling the story um, and for the service you provided to, I would say, millions of kids and families over the years. Please. I just want to add one little Bismarck, I think, said, you never want to see how law and sausage is made. <laughs> Shona and I sat around his dining room table and figured we figured we'd have to negotiate whatever bill we drafted. So we were looking at age range. And we said, well, let's set it at zero. You can't go any lower than that. 
and 26 was then the permissive age for some categorical programs. So we said 26. And what standard developed the maximum potential? We didn't know what the hell it meant, but we could negotiate down. When the two houses, we, I sat there with Charlie and my dad, and they came and they were going to, we thought, quibble about language in the law. They never brought up zero. They never brought up 26. They never brought up to develop the maximum potential. They changed about six little BS things. And that law, in those regards, remains the same today, 50 years later, which is absolutely amazing in my mind. <laughs> but anyway, that's it. May I add one comment? May I add one comment? Sure. Briefly, I'll be done. Michigan is famous for some things in respect to law outside of Michigan. I happen to be asked at my orals, do you know you're from Kalamazoo? You're a Michigan. Do you happen to know anything about the Michigan Supreme Court decision of 1874? I said, yes, I think so. I was never taught anything about it, but I think if I got the date right now, that had to do with the, the right of state monies, taxes, to be spent for education going beyond the eighth grade. That was the decision. Well, thank you again, Dr. Ace. Thank, thank you, you, board. Thank you, presenters. And thank, thank you, you very much. Very very much. much. Well, let's, let's, see if, let's see if the board has any questions or, or comments. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, board members, questions or comments? That was that was really um, rich. That was a really rich, interesting, fascinating tour, and and we're so appreciative, not simply of you coming today, but of your leadership decades earlier. As you point out, uh, Mr. Beekman, uh, generations of our kids have benefited from those early negotiations. How how powerful is that? Had the opportunity to speak with the group out in the hallway, and you were, um, I, I, uh, I heard um, um, one of you say, and our law, the state's law, is better than the federal law. And in a number of ways, there's no question but that that is, uh, that that is the, the case. They each provide enormous protection for children who, when I was coming up, weren't protected at all. And, and so we appreciate that, and we appreciate you. Board members, any questions or comments before we pivot? I just want to say ditto, and thank you for that history. I love uh, history, and so thank you for bringing that uh, to us. Uh, it was a great presentation and a point of privilege. I want to say congratulations to Dr. Kelsey. It was good to hear the doctor in front of that, so, so thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. There you go. Thank you, everyone. Thank you much. Thank you again. Ms. Lipton has a question on the uh, on the chat. Not always, uh, not always obvious. I apologize. Ms. Lipton, to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the presenters. Uh, when I was in the legislature, um, working on issues that uh, overlaid sometimes with the special education laws, all of your names came up, and so. Um, you can rest assured that uh, your work has not gone uh, on unnoticed. And uh, there are many of us that um, uh, really um, owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to those of you that had the foresight um, and also the tenacity and persistence uh, to see... Uh, to see this transformative law through. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the question that I have is, if I might ask uh, of you, um, if you uh, have any reflections, and certainly um, if the answer is, is, uh, is none, that's, that's certainly fair. Um, but as someone that has been um, in the education space uh, for some time in the legislature and interfacing specifically with parents of students um, receiving special education services um, and hearing uh, 
some of the difficulties that these parents have, um, particularly with um, the uh, receiving of services from the school districts. Um, could any of you reflect upon um, what changes uh, if you uh, uh, had a magic wand? Um, what some of those uh, changes or, 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 or suggestions that you might offer to those of us that are uh, still in the uh, policy-making space, if you will. I will take a stab at that, but I don't think the legislature is going to like the answer. That's okay. I'm not a, I'm not in the legislature anymore. <laughs> when we drafted this law, quite frankly, 50 years ago, we wanted to keep the legislature away. And you'll notice the way the law was structured. The department was given great discretion in coming up with regulations in practically every area. And I think that was smart, particularly given what's transpired in terms of the legislature's intervention, and I'll speak solely to special ed, that when it is done so, I would be one who would question whether it should have gotten into it, and secondly, then how it went about it. Um, I think one of the things they could do today would be to give greater priority to funding of special ed, which has always been a problem from day one. I know uh, Dr. Kay has been very uh, vigorous in his efforts in that regard. Funding is not the sole answer to the problems that we have, but it is certainly a major one. And um, that's probably enough said and maybe too much said. It's well said. Thank you. Ms. Lipton, any more? Yes, thank you. I do appreciate that, and I, and I share with... Uh, um, I, I, I share those sentiments. Um, uh, it isn't uh, solely about money, but certainly it. Uh, one cannot have a robust discussion about providing uh, special education services without discussing money. Um, but that brings me to another uh, question that I have, and that is... Um, can, uh, or, or can one of you or, or, or all of you perhaps opine on um, the challenges that a, um, uh, a somewhat unregulated special education, I'm sorry, a somewhat unregulated uh, charter school uh, creation framework in this state um, on the challenges that that may impose on on funding, um, uh, and uh, what I mean by that more specifically is that um, uh, when I was in the legislature, uh, there seemed to be a notion that charter schools are providing um, the full body of services that. Um, uh, what I will call traditional public schools are providing. Um, and in fact, um, by a variety of measures such as uh, selection process, application process, transportation issues, so on and so forth, um, that wasn't the case. And a very large proportion, th th this occurred particularly in Detroit, um, a large proportion of special education students um, were being served at the public school um, and causing uh, severe funding challenges. Uh, do any of you have any reflections on how our current system of uh, charter schools in Michigan uh, interplays with the uh, funding and delivery of special education services to all students? I'll be very brief. There, I have a 
relative who was uh, working on his doctorate at Duke University in public policy. And I had a book that I found that was interesting enough to me. It, the first 40 pages had to do with research on the achievements of students in public and private uh, institutions. <clears throat> and those included even the uh, private institutions conducted in public school buildings at the same time. The first 40 pages gave you the conclusion. The last 100 plus pages provided all the basic data. There's a suggestion in there that the private schools are doing very well in achievement at all levels, and that special education was among some of the top ones that provided those. I don't want to say anything that, that I know. It's only something that I read, and I wish I could cite this, the particular publication in the book, but I gave it to my son, my, my uh, uh, grandson at Duke for his his use and study. We also have a public school teacher over here, uh, a private school teacher present here, who was probably as great in the provision of services for handicapped within that particular private school. That's the individual. I'm not talking about everybody. I don't under, I don't know. Why do they say so much when I don't know? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. You're entitled. Do, do either of our other two presenters want to uh, hazard a response to that? I have no basis to respond to it. Sorry. Council, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Zuckerberg? Um, no. <laughs> no. Okay. We, we appreciate your presentation. Congratulations. Thank you so much for being with us Thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. They run the downhill though. Please tell them I said hello and good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Save something for the drives. We need we need uh we need Jason. board executive for a minute. <coughs> Board members, we've moved to the regular meeting at 2.54. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of October 12th, 2021. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not seconding. Can you repeat which? October 12th, 2021. So I've got a motion from uh, Dr. Pritchett, a uh, support from Dr. Albrich. Any discussion? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. October 12, 2021 meeting minutes. Lipton. Yes. McMillan. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Pugh. Snyder. 
Yes. Strayhorn. Yes. Tilly. Absent. Albrich. Yes. Motion carries. Very good. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of November 9th, 2021? So moved. So we have a, uh, there, there was a, 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 a moment of anticipation there. Um, <laughs> Pritchett moves. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Mr. Strayhorn seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none. If we could, uh, Dr. Pugh. <laughs> You have to slow these things down. It takes me a minute to talk. But um, I would like to go back to the minutes, and I think it was around the area of discussion followed at the end of the legislative uh, discussion. And I just want to make sure that there was clarity there. And let me see, let me pull them these up. Uh, And so I'm in the legislative discussion portion. And there was a section that says discussion followed. And I just want to, I was trying to listen to the minutes or the, the meeting tape video from last month. But I just want to bring clarity that we had a discussion at the end that was, that talked about the uh, proposed resolutions. And we talked about, uh, definitely for the COVID-19, we said that, that we were going to break those out. And I just want to make sure that we add that, because I think that that would have brought some clarity to the conversation earlier this morning. Right. So, so uh, board members, just to just so that we're all on the same page, uh, Dr. Pugh presented a resolution in October. It was a three-part public health resolution. The first part was associated with mandatory masks. Uh, mandated by the State Director of Health and Human Services. Uh, the second was a um, was support for the President Biden uh, vaccination initiative. And then the third was support of interagency um, interagency cooperation among Eagle, MDHHS, and MDE on uh, air and water quality. We did indicate at that uh, November meeting that we would be considering those separately in the legislative committee. We did consider those separately in the legislative committee. And I believe during our legislative update, our chair is going to be reporting out on what was discussed at that, uh, at that meeting. If I recall correctly, you weren't able to attend that meeting. But I believe our chair is going to report out on the discussion from that legislative meeting um, in, in whatever, in the next 30 or 45 minutes. Okay. So I, and I just would like to propose those, those changes to the minutes. Fair enough. So, so the, the proposal is to add a sentence indicating that the, uh, uh, there was discussion to a note that the uh, board legislative committee would be considering the public health resolution put forward by Dr. Pugh in three different bites, if you will, for the three different subject areas. That would then come back to this table. That, that would then come back in some form yeah. um, to this table. That's right. As recommended by by the the legislative committee, in whatever form the legislative committee were to were to recommend it, yes, absolutely. And I think that that work is still ongoing. Yes, Ms. Snyder. Anything was, else was on the meeting? Was there a time prescribed for it? There was no there was no specific time prescription associated with it. We did meet just a few weeks later. We did engage mm -hmm. on this particular uh, topic. That engagement is not sure. is not finished, however. Um, anything more for discussion about the meeting minutes as amended by Dr. Pugh? I didn't hear any disagreement with the friendly amendment to the meeting minutes. Hearing none, if we could have a, a vote on the uh, meeting minutes of November 9th, 2021. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Richa? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Snyder? Abstain. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Absent. Albridge? Abstain. 
Mm -hmm. Five, yes. Yep. Motion carries. Thank you, board members. We are at the report of the president. Dr. Albert. Oh, well, I think I speak for everyone when I say, thank goodness this year is over, uh, or almost. Um, this obviously has been a rough December. This past weekend, I drove through Oxford for the first time since the tragic shooting two weeks ago. My husband and I have a place in Lake Orion, which is about three miles from Oxford. And uh, it, was, it was both heartwarming and horrendous to see all of the Oxford strong signs and the blue and yellow ribbons that are tied around trees and uh, signs and uh, throughout communities in that area. And it's, I think, a reminder of how <clears throat> this tragedy has affected the entire community. It's affected the region, the state, and even um, the nation. I also wanted to recognize that today is the anniversary of the Sandy Hook shooting, where 20 little kids and six adults were shot and killed nine years ago. And like the aftermath of most shootings, in both cases, we saw many offerings of thoughts and prayers. Um, generally speaking, keeping someone in your thoughts is a beautiful thing. It means that you care about them. And if you're a praying person, I think offering prayer is a spiritual act of kindness and love. Um, but these words used together after a tragedy seem to lose their well intentions. They become very perfunctory and uh, seem to get used in place of action, implying an inability to act uh, or affect any real change. So I've been thinking about this a lot lately. And uh, thoughts and prayers suffers from this phenomena called semantic satiation, whereby a word or a phrase gets repeated so often that it loses its meaning. And so I looked back and, you know, from 2013 to 2019, uh, every town research and policy identified 549 incidents of gunfire on school grounds. Of these, 347 occurred on the grounds of an elementary, middle, or high school resulting in 129 deaths and 270 wounded individuals. At least 280 or 208, excuse me, of these victims were students. So while mass shootings are still relatively rare, they're less than 1% of school gunfire incidents, they account for almost 25% of the overall gun deaths and 12% of all people shot and wounded in schools. As we have seen, these statistics do not begin to capture the collective impact that these shootings have on not only the schools in which they occur, but in the communities, the students, the parents, everyone. So we've had too much opportunities, I think, to offer our thoughts and prayers. And while I hope that we continue to think about the victims of yet another senseless act of violence, and we continue to offer our prayers for everyone affected. Um, but thoughts and prayers are not enough. I think, you know, we need to act. Earlier today, Nikki, I think, raised an important question about empowering teachers and those closest to the students and what that should look like. And we should probably think about how the department could be a partner in those efforts. I think school <coughs> health culture is absolutely important. Today's presentation on social emotional learning and our guests from Farmington, Ferndale, and Kalamazoo Public Schools talking about how they work with students on self-awareness and relationship building, conflict resolution, empathy, trust, all of that, but they can't do it alone. Um, Michigan ranks 49th in student to counselor ratio with 671 students for every one school counselor. We need to do better with that statistic. We also need to increase access to health, mental health services, and I applaud the department working with the legislature and the governor's office to increase funding in this area um, and making sure that we get that, those funds out to the districts, particularly now. I mean, obviously, it's vitally important right now. Uh, look at safety measures inside schools, making sure that funding, some of the federal funding perhaps that we're utilizing right now goes into uh, safety things like locking mechanisms and, and things like that. 
And then I think we have to engage in real conversations about gun safety and reasonable gun laws that are in everyone's best interest and hold those accountable who violate those laws. One of the complaints that we heard from the sheriff in this whole scenario was that, you know, even when individuals are caught violating gun laws, oftentimes nothing happens or very little happens to them. Um, evidence suggests that most school shooters get the guns that they use from either family, relatives, or friends. So we need to look at things like secure storage laws. That should be part of this conversation. Um, you know, there's, I grew up in a, a a family of hunters. I have fa a family that are uh, competitive shooters. You know, I, I get it. I understand. But there's a responsibility that comes with that. And they recognize that. And I think it's time that we finally had this conversation. So honestly, I'll just say, naively, I thought that Sandy Hook would have been the beginning of the end. And, you know, if we couldn't have had real reasonable change after that, um, but I don't think we can stop. We can't just say, that's it. Stoneman Douglas, high school shooting, that seemed like a turning point. Clearly not enough. Um, and now it's, it's our turn, it's in our backyard. And I think we've all offered our sincere thoughts and prayers, but now what? So what are we gonna do? So I would suggest, uh, you know, I'd love to have more conversations with the department about this. Uh, maybe the legislative committee could have a discussion about uh, real tangible things that we would like to recommend. Um, and I look forward to continuing this conversation, but I, I don't, I don't want to just end it with thoughts and prayers. I think we, we really need to start thinking about action and outcomes. Um, so with that, I hope everyone has a happy, healthy, and safe holiday and a, a wonderful new year. Um, and I know uh, several of us will be watching football throughout <laughs> the next few weeks. Um, but uh, I, I really hope that you all um, get to take a little bit of time off, uh, regroup with your families, um, reconnect, and uh, we'll see, see you again in a whole new year, which hopefully is, is a much better year than the last couple we've had. Thank you, President Albrich. Uh, report of the State Superintendent, Ms. Patty Redinger, Director of Federal Affairs in the Office of Governor Gretchen Whitmer, has represented the governor at the board table since May of 2021. Ms. Redinger would like to share a few comments with us. Uh, she is virtual. She has the largest book collection of anybody um, in the Zoom room uh, this afternoon. Ms. Redinger, to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Isis. I get compliments on this all day long on many of these calls, but I will uh, never tell a lie, and it is available on the web. It is not my, my uh, living room, unfortunately. So if anyone wants the file, let me know. But thank you, Dr. Ice. I um, asked just for a few minutes to address the board, um, as this is going to be my last meeting uh, in this role for the governor. Um, as Dr. Rice says, uh, on the federal affairs side, I've been with the governor and her administration since uh, the beginning of 2019 and was asked to um, step into the shoes that were um, uh, left behind when my previous colleague um, uh, had departed for Leo, uh, Brandy Johnson, who I think you all know, um, and in the role of the acting policy director earlier this year, um, I was then uh, asked to, to represent the board on behalf of the governor. And so um, our policy team has um, hired a new policy director. We're in the midst now of also hiring uh, someone to handle K-12 specifically uh, for that team. And it's, the, I know those discussions are in the finality now, and that person um, will most likely then when selected be the, the new representative for the governor to the board, and you'll probably see them in the January meeting. So I just wanted to take a moment to say it's been a privilege to serve and, and somewhat apropos that this is uh, my final meeting uh, with Mr. Barron here from Louisville Hills School District. Um, uh, good to see you. And, and as she knows, I'm a proud uh, alum of the school district there and having uh, served on Capitol Hill within our Michigan delegation here in DC uh, moons ago, um, 
handled the special education discussions on the IDEA front uh, numerous times over and always knew Michigan's leadership and uh, as Dr. Pugh uh, had mentioned, it was great to know the history behind um, the state in that uh, domain as well. So uh, to that end, again, thank you Dr. Rice for the time and uh, happy holidays to all. Thank you, Ms. Redinger. We appreciate you. We appreciate your service. Um, we're disappointed that that library is not, in fact, a real library in your living room. <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> so, uh, so, a, so a few things. I, I would like to lend my support to the comments of our, uh, our board president. I would like to offer my condolences to the Oxford community. I did have the opportunity to attend a vigil in Oxford three nights after um, the, the killings. And um, it really was, was heartbreaking to be um, in the midst of that community, in the dark, in the cold, outside, um, grieving actively for the young people who had been killed and others who were um, at that time in the hospital. So often children uh, and young adults who commit these horrible crimes are young people that have felt disconnected for one reason or another from their schools or their school communities over a period of many years. And that feeling of disconnect uh, coupled with their mental illness permits these sorts of acts to happen if they felt a greater connection, uh, a, a greater belonging within the school community. One wonders if they would commit these sorts of actions. If we had the requisite mental health services in our schools, notwithstanding, I and mean, we've certainly improved the funding over uh, the last 12 months in the state and by extension over the last three years, but there's so much more that can and should be done. It is guidance counselors to our president's point, but it's also broader mental health services as well. Uh, Ms. Snyder mentioned that, that if a child is in need, particularly acute need, he needs to be seen immediately. Absolutely no question about that. And we need to staff up to make that happen so that when you have those acute needs, that there is the ability to be seen and be served immediately, not in particular communities, but all communities. That's to the fairness that we, we want for our uh, system. I'd like to um, just say rest in peace to Dr. Richard Hallett, former superintendent of the Lansing School District. May he rest in peace. Um, he was a 34-year veteran of Lansing School District 15 years as, uh, as an urban superintendent. It's not an easy gig. It's easier to talk about it than it is to walk it. Um, I wanna thank uh, as well, uh, Bloomfield Hills Board Trustee Howard Barron for his lifting up of the state's top 10 strategic education plan and his understanding of the potential of that plan, but the need to work the plan uh, to its potential. I also want to thank our special education collaborators, trailblazers, historians, celebrants. They were powerful. Lynn Beekman, Professor Charlie Mange, who was just being brief, <laughs> and Harvey Zuckerberg, along with their colleagues for their fierce advocacy on behalf of our children with disabilities. You really can make an impact, and that impact really can endure. And I think that was uh, part of the story today. And then I only um, would like to mention one other thing, uh, board and members of the community. It is 96 days until spring. Spring begins March 20th. I pointed out, and I'm going to be pointing it out a lot in the next several weeks, because our legislature needs to take action on teacher recruitment and retention initiatives, our 300 to 500 million dollar proposed package, it needs to take action by the beginning of spring. If it does, we have five months in the education community across the state of Michigan to make those efforts 
have an effect on next school year. If the legislature does not act on teacher recruitment and retention until the fiscal year 23 budget is approved in the summer, or worse still, doesn't act at all, there will be no impact on next school year of these initiatives, and the shortage will continue to adversely affect our children and by extension staff and communities. 96 days, the clock is ticking. Thank you, board. Now we turn to the report of the Teacher of the Year, Ms. Leah Porter. The 2021-2022 Michigan Teacher of the Year will present her report. Ms. Porter is a third grade teacher at Wilcox Elementary School and Holt Public Schools. Ms. Porter is joined by, by Ms. Beth Vonk, Region 8 Teacher of the Year from Washtenaw International Middle Academy and High School in Ypsilanti. Ms. Vonk teaches International Baccalaureate Language and Literature. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Ladies, Teachers of the Year, welcome. Hello, Dr. Rice Board. I, uh, this afternoon has been that special education presentation is something that's going to stay with me for a long time. That was really, I was honored to be here today to, to see that. So I just had to share that because I'm just like, I don't want to follow that in any way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be free. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to start with my, oh, they switched out the order for me. Didn't know that. Okay. My order was different. It's fine. We'll roll with it. <laughs> I'm very happy to have uh, Miss Beth Vonk here with me today. Um, getting to work with the regional teachers is a highlight of this role this year, and I am just in awe of her. Uh, she is going to share a little bit about herself to get started. Okay. Um, good afternoon, board. I am so pleased to be here. I have really enjoyed the presentations today, especially the special ed pres presentation and getting to see the inner workings um, here, we're going to be showing you a little bit behind the curtain of teaching, and so it's nice to see the behind the works of what you do. Um, I currently teach in a baccalaureate, an interna international baccalaureate school. We started this um, middle school program nine years ago, and the high school program started 11 years ago, so we've kind of joined them. Um, we are a Washtenaw County consortium option, and... Um, student's choice in, there is no, um, it's first come, first serve. It's not a competitive process by any means, and it is just the opportunity to have an IB education. Um, we take from all over Washtenaw County and some, um, a little bit in Wayne um, County as well. I have been teaching for 41 years in all the grades, um, pre-K through high school, except kindergarten. <laughs> My mother taught kindergarten for 30 years, so I kind of felt I did it. Um, and, you know, you're making the little frogs that jump with math their way and, you know, all that other stuff. But, um, it, you know, I taught everything else, and it is still such a pleasure to do this. Um, my job has changed dramatically over the last 41 years. I've seen the changes in teaching, and I enjoy every single minute. Um, I served three years on the Bill and Melinda Gates Teacher Advisory Council, um, which was an ex incredible experience because I didn't just get to work with 10 top teachers in Michigan. I also got to work with 50 teachers from all over the United States that were, um, you know, the tops in their field. And it was incredible to rub elbows with them and give, you know, my view on policy. Um, my mission is to help identify, um, help, help people identify, celebrate, and use and grow all their unique gifts because everybody has a gift. Sometimes um, I need to help them find it. Sometimes they need to help me find it, but we are always searching and then growing it. So that is a little bit about me. I just have to share one other thing about Beth that she did not share, that she helped to start the middle school that she now works at. That was, she had a hand in developing that program in that yeah. school. So I just, she didn't share that, and I just think that's just amazing. So, yeah. oh, sorry, I'm having all kinds of tech difficulties. Okay, so um, as I have shared before in the past few board meetings, it is, um, just so joyful and wonderful to be able to work collaboratively with another regional teacher of the year and getting to know teachers across the state. 
Beth and I um, have a commonality in the fact that we are um, working uh, with our districts on the Future Pride Michigan Educator Initiative. Both of our districts were grant recipients, as Dr. Rice spoke about earlier, and uh, we have been working in our districts to develop um, programs within our schools. So we're going to share a little bit about where that is, like right from the lens of how schools are utilizing that grant money and the first steps in helping to build the teacher workforce within our student populations. Anything you want to add there, Beth? No, I okay. think that's <laughs> okay. That's what we're doing. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll start with my uh, school district. As you know, I work for Holt Public Schools. And we uh, received the grant this past spring, and the district put together a team of teachers across K-12 to help kind of build and brainstorm how we were going to use this grant money and build a uh, pre-service teacher exploration class for the high school. Uh, as I've shared with you before, 40% uh, of the students in whole, uh, public schools identify as non-white, and we have a, a very high percentage of uh, teachers that identify as white in our district. And so uh, part of our goal is to start to mirror our student population with uh, the teachers that we are hiring. And so there's a lot of intentionality in um, making sure that we are uh, representing all of our students in this particular course. Right now, uh, our course is going to look as a semester-long course that at this time will be recommended by teachers that see uh, and are kind of mentoring students to that have interest in an education field or have interest in teaching or a teaching field to go into our class. It will be offered to students uh, ninth through 12th grade. Um, and so all students will have the opportunity if they are interested and able. And um, part of that as well as that classroom placements for all students in the course uh, will be with mentor teachers across our district. And we are working on uh, being able to provide transportation to those locations so we can have equity across our, our buildings. And um, our current course is being developed um, with using the modules from MDE and also um, some other pieces that we have implemented in it. Um, right now, we are going to pilot our course this coming semester. Uh, we are having 10 students that will be piloting our course at the high school. Um, along with the modules, we use some of the grant money to um, kind of enrich the, the students' experiences with different text and current articles. Some of the books that were purchased um, for students to use are Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain by Zaretta Hammond, We Want to Do More Than Survive by Bettina Love, Fostering Resilient Learners by Kristen Sowers and Peter A. Hall, and Hacking School Discipline by Brad Weinstein and Nathan Maynard. So we're going to be embedding some of that in that curriculum as well. And we are also embedding the exploration of other careers in the field of education in order to um, give students an opportunity to see that it's not just teachers, but many other professionals that make our schools work. Okay, so um, at, in our district, which is the Washtenaw Edu Education Options Consortium, consisting of three programs, um, e Early College Alliance at Eastern, um, the a WAVE program, which is a um, credit recovery program, and YHI and WIMA. Um, we chose to do it each, we received a grant as the district, and we are doing, each school is doing something individual. So I'm speaking to how we are using this at WIMA and YHI. Our, part our participants are currently all um, students of color. They, um, what, the way we chose them is we sent out a form just asking who is interested in something like this. And because of the way that our IB program works, we don't really have um, a slot to put it in. So they have to overlap with another class. So they're taking this at the same time as they're taking another class. So we had to think about that when we were designing what we were doing. So we use the modules from the state of um, the state board. Uh, what is it called? Sorry. The um, Department of Education. Mm -hmm. We use the modules from there, which are exceptional. Mm -hmm. And we kind of modified them to fit um, chunks that we put on Google Classroom. And the students come into a, to a teacher's classroom that they are matched with, a mentor teacher. And we pull back the curtain. And we are treating them kind of like um, many student teachers. And we are telling them exactly, you know, what we are doing because everybody's been to school. We know what teaching looks like 
from the student um, standpoint. But students don't really know what the teachers are doing or what the teachers are thinking. So we're very intentional about letting them know what we're doing and why we're doing it. So they um, come in, they watch the little videos, they do the readings, they have journal entries that they have to do every week, and then they have to do an observation form, and they talk with the teachers, they do meetings with me and my um, partner, and we are seeing some amazing work and amazing questions come out of this program. I think it's because I had it over there. There you go. Okay. So this is just a sample of what it looks like mm -hmm. um, just for weeks one and two. They will have their observation notes, their journal responses, and then the different readings are on there. And there's a question for each one of the readings that they have to respond to. I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. There we go. Okay. okay so I'm going to just move this in. Oh, gracious. Thanks for the, there we go. There we go. So um, this was just a um, sample um, journal question that we would ask. And um, just go out of that, yep. Right here? Yep, just click right there. There we go. Okay, and the sample response that she was talking about how the iceberg chart is useful um, when having students get to know each other. A lot, of persons, I, a lot of a person's identity is not noticeable. For example, a person's gender identity may differ from their gender expression. The iceberg chart helps imply that it's important to refrain from assuming things about a person. A lot of people assume a person's pronouns because of how normalized it is in society. This chart can be can teach us that we should ask and listen to people rather than assume, which can possibly offend us. It may be difficult to adapt to be more inclusive because of societal pressure and normalization. Now, these are things that the student writes, and whatever they write is their response, and then we discuss it with them, and we say, how do you see that being played out in the classroom? And we are just looking for what the student is seeing and how it affects them on a personal level and how they want to um, move forward in the field of education, what this means to them. So with that, um, I know because ours is still more in the infancy stage where you're already having the opportunity in your district that's to start developing your, uh, your in real time right now with students. Um, I, we have done some brainstorming in our district about things we think will be real potential successes on top of obviously growing the workforce of, stu of teachers and some of the hurdles that we're continuing to face as we're brainstorming how to navigate these things. So one of the pieces that we have talked about a great deal in our committee is that uh, our hopes that the mentor teacher, the collaborating teacher with the student can, uh, if that student wants to have a mentor relationship after that experience, that that will be an opportunity for them to continue to have that that established relationship with that mentor teacher over the course of the time they're at high school and beyond. As we all know, the purpose of future partnership and educator initiatives in the state is to grow your own teaching workforce, and we're hoping that that will, uh, you know, come forth in whole public schools as well. And then, of course, that we want to increase diversity of candidates for our teacher prep programs, both you know across the state, but also within our own district. As I mentioned before, um, our teacher or our students do not mirror our teacher teaching faculty. Mm -hmm. Some of our hurdles is how are we developing interest in the course? You know, students already have rigorous course loads, and making sure that um, we're giving a lot of information ahead of time in the junior high specifically that this course is an option, um, and giving it kind of an equal playing field with other exploratory career courses that we already offer at the high school. Right now, we have figured out transportation this year for the 10 students that will be piloting the program, but we have been trying to brainstorm how we're going to get those students to their um, their potential classroom uh, placements if they are not close to the high school and really wanting to make sure that students have the opportunity to go to many uh, buildings across our district. And then finally, um, it is starting to be talked about at the Ingham um, Intermediate School District about the potential of bringing a course to their CTE program around education and wondering if that might be something that will transition them how our course looks or if that will be a precursor to going to the CTE program. That's all things to come down the road. Um, successes that we've had is that we have made teaching visible to um, the students who are in our classroom. We're collaborating as a community. 
We're showcasing how valuable education is. And in fact, I do want to point out that we have several um, graduate assistants who are people who have um, either received their college degree or almost finished with a college degree coming in and working in our building. As grads, they do subbing and other work that needs to be done who are former students. And, um, and several of them are people of color who have come in and they are joining us because they know that we need a broader, a broader spectrum of teachers in our classrooms. Um, they, we do, and they are engaging in the interests of students and we have a very large pool because we're a very a diverse community. We, um, we're probably, um, I, I don't know the, the numbers, but I think we're probably um, at the at least 50-50. It's, um, we have a lot of different nationalities. People come from all over to come into our program. The hurdles are that um, the IB workload is horrendous at the junior and senior levels, and it may dissuade people from taking these additional courses because, like I said, they have to do double duty. Um, but it has not stopped the um, students who are working in it currently, and we have six who are interested in doing it um, next semester. Um, the availability of mentor teachers, um, we found that they aren't always available when the students are available. The class schedules don't always meet, so we don't want to put more than one student in um, with a teacher because that's a, a burden on classes that are already at 32. Um, parental and peer pressure to investigate more lucrative professions has been incredibly um, huge. Um, in our community, a lot of students say, I really want to do this, but my parents say I need to investigate engineering or I need to go into medical or I need to do these things because I'm not going to be able to live as a teacher. So just, and you know, they, they know what it's like to, you know, the pay of a teacher is not um, sustainable for many people if you don't have a partner. And that's unfortunate. Beth and I are um, just very excited about the work that our districts have currently been doing and are proud to be a part of the beginning initiatives for Future Pride Michigan Educator, both in our districts and, you know, what it will become across the state. So I'm excited to think about what it might be a year from now. I don't know. Hopefully we'll just continue yeah. to grow. It's exciting to share with high school students because I've always had um, students from University of Michigan or Eastern Michigan University. and sharing with high school students is like a whole different world um, because you're setting them off on a journey that's just beginning, not ending. And it is um, really fabulous to just see them get so wrapped up in the students and so wrapped up in what we're doing. And I love the conversations that we have. I don't know if you want me to share my update now or if there's any questions. I didn't know if we'd want to wait until the very share end. your update. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So um, I got an opportunity in November to go to a few uh, places across the state. I just wanted to take a moment to share a little bit with that with you. As you know, last November, Janet Swarthout was here with me, and she was in the midst of dress rehearsals for her show of Chicago. Later that week, I went on that Friday and spent the day with her in her classroom and got to watch her uh, teach her speech courses. It was so much fun. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. <laughs> Afterwards, I stayed for the evening and uh, went to see the show. Uh, Sheldora Haynes is also another regional teacher of the year. She drove up from the Saginaw area to join me for the show. It was amazing. I, Janet is an incredible, incredible human being. And knowing that she, she somehow is. pulled off a musical in the midst of a pandemic was uh, just to be applauded. And it was so enjoyable, probably the best high school musical I've ever seen. So that was really exciting. After the presentation that was here at the board about early childhood, I reached out to Bay Aranac um, and to Heritage Southwest to see if I could visit them and see them. And I started uh, in Bay Aranac um, a few weeks ago and I got to spend the morning uh, with Gretchen Wagner who was here at the board table back in October. And I got to visit several of the um, preschool programs across that uh, county, which was so much fun. Oh my gosh, I had the best <laughs> morning of my life sitting with preschoolers, talking to them as they were engaging in their learning, reading to them, um, and just kind of getting my fill as I'm no longer in the primary setting. 
uh, in the afternoon, um, after I reached out to Gretchen, she said, you know, you might want to stop and see our CTE programs in Bay Aranac. And so I spent the afternoon there. I started off in their student-led restaurant called Blooming Chefs. If you're ever in that area, you should go. It's open every weekday uh, for lunch. And it was amazing. The uh, students build the menu. They have a monthly menu that uh, stu each student take, gets an opportunity to create a dish that's on the monthly menu. They also have daily specials. They do desserts every day. They serve. They do all the components of that restaurant. It was so uplifting to see um, students in action. I also got to visit um, a few other of their programs. I got to see their dental program and I got to see their cybersecurity program and I had a group of um, young men that were ready and raring to go with a presentation for me. Uh, it was dynamic, similar to what we saw on the SEL um, presentation today. Just really filled my heart to see such leaders and um, students that are ready to transition into adulthood. It was just a really incredible day in Bay Aranac. And then the following day, because that's just how it worked in the schedule, I drove the opposite direction in the state and I went to Heritage Southwest with Chris Whitmer, who we got to see in real time at the board meeting. She took me across the entire county. I saw all 12 of their preschool programs. Got to meet all the teachers, see the commonalities in their classrooms. Um, if you get a chance to go in person, I highly suggest you do. It was a magical day of thinking about early childhood and the power it has when Teachers in early childhood settings work together collaboratively, use their ideas to grow their programs and um, just really build rich experiences for kids. And it was just absolutely dynamic. So I was just so much fun with all those littles over those course of those couple of days. So we thank you so much. I appreciate the time that you give us each month here at the board table. We, we thank you, our Teachers of the Year. We appreciate uh, the promotion of future proud Michigan educator, which of course is a promotion of the profession that we all care about so, uh, so much, and by extension our kids um, as well. We do better in this regard, we'll do better with, uh, with teacher quantity, teacher diversity, teacher quality as well. Thank you. Board members, any questions or comments? Questions or comments for our Teachers of the Year? It is 3.37. I feel a an ebbing of energy in the room <laughs> as we're winding down for the day. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Happy I holidays. would also like to invite anybody, if you are in Washtenaw County, to come visit our program. It is really spectacular. The feeling in the building, you will feel it as soon as you walk in the door. Um, the feeling of love and support for one another and the way that um, International Baccalaureate um, Education just sticks with kids. If you can come there at um, 8 in the morning, we start at 8.20, and kids are still are working already. You can come there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We get out at 3.15, and you will think school is still in session because that is how amazing this program is. So Michigan is going places. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Towards 3.38, the next item on today's agenda is state and federal legislative update. Uh, Mr. Martin Ackley, our director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs, will lead the state and federal legislative update, followed by Ms. Lipton, our uh, SBE legislative committee chair, and finally, Dr. Pritchett with a, an hour-long report on NASB. I do not have <laughs> <laughs> That is your holiday Dr. gift from Dr. me. Dr. <laughs> Pritchett is indicating that, that she has an abbreviated no report. report as a gift for all of us. Oh. Mr. Ackley, to you, then to Ms. Lipton. I'll be abbreviated as well. Um, so the legislature um, is meeting today. This will be the last day that they're scheduled to be in for this calendar year. Of course, the session goes on until next year, so it's a two-year session. But for this year, calendar year today is the last day they're in session. So they may be actually working through the night to get some legislation done um, through that. Uh, two big things that they are working on. One is a, a package, an economic um, incentive package, a billion-dollar strategic outreach and, attra and attraction reserve they're creating. But there's also a supplemental going through right now. It's a billion dollar supplemental. There are several things in there that are educated related. There is a $10 million uh, line item to create a teacher talent pipeline. Uh, it's a grant for an educated related nonprofit organization that supports teacher talent uh, pipeline through recruitment, training, development, and retention. There's uh, 
$5 million going to help fund the child and adolescent health care centers. There's $150 million going for school safety, which is really the COVID dollars going to schools um, to give them the equipment uh, and to do testing, um, testing activity, screening, to help facilitate continued opening and reopening of schools and safe operations of schools during the pandemic. Um, there's a $100,000 line item for mental health crisis services in Oakland County. I'm only assuming that that's for um, assistance to students um, or families during the, as a result of the Oxford uh, event. Uh, so that is the supplemental that's going through the legislature right now. There are maybe a couple handfuls of bills um, that they will push through. There's a big package of child care bills that is expected to um, be moved today and tonight, uh, which the department supports. Um, it includes increasing the ratio of children to caregivers um, from one, per, one to six to one to seven. And there are also some reporting requirements um, in there to help, um, help child care um, institutions. And we're also hearing that there's a, a bill to allow for uh, school employees other than teachers to actually um, serve as subs. Um, we have, I think we've discussed that here, or at least in the legislative committee, um, that allow them, like bus drivers or, or food service people, to act as, come in as subs without having to meet all the requirements for subs. Um, as the bill was introduced, that would be sunset at June of next year. So it's just for the rest of the school year. Uh, we are not supportive of that bill, but we hear that it's going through um, possibly uh, today. And so that's really the legislative action that's, um, that they're working on the last day of session uh, this year. Um, and the State Board Legislative Committee meeting um, was on December 2nd. And I will pass it off to Ms. Lipton. Thank you, Mr. Ackley. Ms. Lipton, to you. Thank you. Uh, as Mr. Ackley said, we, the Legislative Committee met on December 2nd, and we discussed uh, a few items. Um, the first item we discussed uh, was uh, the uh, passing of the um, Michigan Association of School Board Resolution uh, that we heard more about during um, public comment by uh, Trustee Howard Barron. Um, that was a resolution that was passed at the uh, MASB uh, annual meeting uh, in Grand Rapids, November the 11th. Um, and we uh, discussed uh, the content of that resolution and um, being uh, generally supportive of it, but uh, there was no um, indication of a uh, unified uh, statement or board response. Um, and so individual members will be, uh, uh, as they see fit, to uh, show their support of that uh, resolution um, in, the, uh, in, in the coming months. Uh, next, we discussed a um, multi-tiered uh, resolution that had been referred to our committee by Dr. Pugh, uh, covering three uh, general areas uh, that have been outlined by, uh, by Dr. Rice in terms of um, uh, language regarding a vaccine, a uh, state uh, vaccine mandate, um, a uh, mask mandate, and a, um, a statement regarding integrating the work of the department in MD, HHS, and EGLE. Uh, regarding um, water and air quality for the schools. Uh, the discussion surrounded uh, breaking that resolution up into three separate resolutions um, or potentially viewing it in three separate um, pieces um, and taking them each separately 
um, the resolution pertaining to integrating the uh, departments and making sure that their work are collaborative and integrated um, was uh, referred to uh, department drafters um, for uh, specifically um, uh, producing a resolution uh, that was sent to myself and uh, Dr. Pugh for, uh, for comment um, uh, yesterday. Um, then the, uh, the, the second concept that we took up was the issue of um, the uh, President Biden's vaccine mandate. Um, and the general consensus amongst the committee was that uh, there was not necessarily a, a resolution um, that, that, that a resolution could not be crafted because the vaccine mandate as um, referenced in the proposed resolution by President Biden was still a moving target and was caught up in um, court cases. And so the general feeling in the committee was that there would be nothing to resolve to be for or against. Um, and so a, uh, a further wordsmithing of that resolution was not um, referred to the, uh, the department. And then the third concept in terms of the um, uh, mask policy, um, it was discussed uh, by some members of the committee that the board had already issued a resolution on masking and that, um, that the, uh, the, the committee uh, did not refer any additional language uh, to be drafted by the department, but to stand by the current uh, language that was passed um, a couple months ago. Um, and then the last issue that we discussed uh, was the um, the um, moving through the legislative process of uh, two bills, one in the House and one in the Senate that we've um, discussed before at the board table regarding um, the uh, punishment uh, by withholding of funds uh, two districts that teach a certain uh, social studies curriculum. Um, that was a, a, in a House bill, and then a sort of more vaguely worded um, uh, House bill that talks about um, what uh, teachers, um, uh, what, what can't be taught. Um, and there was a general discussion that the uh, largest concern that was expressed in the committee was um, the potential for a chilling effect on teachers um, uh, at being able to have uh, the freedom to teach certain concepts uh, within the social studies curriculum. Um, and that the full breadth of uh, education, including the racial history of this country, um, should be uh, dealt with and teachers have the freedom to teach that um, as part of the social studies curriculum. And so that uh, concept was referred to the department for uh, drafting or crafting a resolution, um, which, uh, I, uh, 
was sent to me uh, uh, to review, um, but it has not been sent to the uh, the uh, remaining members of the board. Um, I believe because it was not um, finished within 24 hours of this board meeting. So hopefully that will be um, in a form to be brought to people for consideration in accordance with our board norms uh, uh, shortly. And then lastly, our next meeting is on December the 28th. Uh, December the 28th, I believe at one o'clock at 1 p.m. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Lipton. Any, uh, any questions or comments regarding the report? Dr. Pugh. I have a lot. Hopefully I can follow some notes here. I guess my first question or my first thought is like the goalposts around this legislative uh, agenda setting and, and statements that we make is just like all over the place. And if somebody could explain it to me, and there's some of us who have been here a little longer than, than the rest. So, I mean, things have kind of like changed. So I'm, I'm trying to catch up to um, what we need to do. And, and I will be honest, because it feels like when I do the things that you're telling me to do, it's changing again. Um, and I don't need to go into all of that. I hope we don't have to go into all of that. But I did get um, some proposals out there, and they've been out there for a little while. I don't recall in the past where um, where the uh, where we didn't have discussions here on legislation that 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 uh, didn't make it out of the legislative meeting. I, I don't recall that. Um, and so I, I just would love for someone to give me uh, where it's documented, where I can see what we're supposed to be doing as a legislative uh, committee. Um, so those are uh, some of my thoughts. I could go into uh, the, the thoughts on the three or four different proposals. Uh, again, the one that was one proposal around uh, the, the uh, layered approach to mitigation uh, strategy. Um, you know, yes, we did make a statement, but we also, uh, as Tom uh, 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 McMillan pointed out in October, we had a budget bill that kind of complicated things. And we also have um, at least at least 500 uh, people dying um, a week, and those numbers could, uh, the last that I've uh, read from the CDC, go up to 1,000 um, persons uh, per week. So... Um, those are concerns of mine. And as we talk about hot topic issues, I just can't think of one that's more important. And I am just um, disappointed that we don't have bills in front of us to discuss that. Uh, no, I could not make the legislative uh, meeting. Unfortunately, because I'm not a part of the legislative committee, somehow the, it doesn't show up on my calendar, but I already had something uh, booked uh, before then. Um, but, but honestly, um, as I had shared with others, I, I've talked about this uh, multiple times. So I've, I'll just put that, that disappointment. The Biden vaccine, we, we could have left off by Biden uh, vaccine mandate, but we could have talked about vaccines um, here at this table. So again, I'm disappointed in that. Um, and the 24-hour rule, I don't know if we voted on that. But even if we didn't, I've gotten proposals to you ahead of 24 hours, uh, months ahead of 24 hours. And um, I didn't know all of these conversations went on in the legislative agenda meeting because the, converse, the, the indications that I got were just a little bit different. But I'm just going to um, say all that to say that we have a lot um, that we should be talking about. And we had a lot of good uh, conversation here today. Um, but uh, Dr. Rice, you brought up the 96 days and you talked about to spring break and you talked about the budget process and losing teachers. Um, 
we're also losing lives. Uh, and we know that last year we saw a wave. So we're butting up against waves. And I just think that there is more that we, sh we can do here and more that we, sh we can be talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, the one thing I can say about Tom is that he has put forward some proposals. Um, they may not have been on the total opposite end of the spectrum, but we were not, um, we were talking about these issues. And I will pause there, but I definitely welcome, welcome uh, clarification on what this process is for us to bring uh, things to the table. And I'm gonna go back, cause I will, I do go back and read the, uh, look at the videos and I'll go back uh, years to see, but I'm pretty sure we were emailed um, the uh, proposed uh, statements and we had a discussion here. And I can understand if these are sticky issues and, and we don't all wanna talk about them openly, but that's what we were elected to do. And I'll, I'll just leave it there. Um, Chairwoman Lipton, would you like me to, uh, to share or would you like to? Uh, well, I think I'll, I'll start um, by saying that um, my, my understanding uh, of the legislative committee, uh, at least as it was explained to me, um, is that um, we can discuss things that, uh, that the committee members bring up or the, that are things that are referred to us. And I've tried to do a combination of that um, in the various meetings that I've chaired. Um, I will say that there does not seem to be a guidance or, um, or really a set of parameters for a legislative committee in the past. And so um, I've gone based on what I think is, you know, a sound policy. Um, I do think that when things are referred to the legislative committee, I do think that it um, it gives in referring them some indication of um, where other members might be at um, in terms of particular issues. Um, but I will comment on the fact that the legislative committee does not have a staff member, um, or at least I'm not aware of that. Um, nor does the legislative committee have a budget, um, and then I'm not aware of that. Um, so absent um, someone from the committee um, or someone on the board drafting a resolution, um, that is uh, that is that is what we have uh, to work with. Um, and uh, in terms of to the extent when the department does volunteer to um, take some of the ideas that the legislative committee is discussing, because there are members of the department that do attend the meetings, um, at least from my vantage point, that is welcomed because um, we uh, on the committee, uh, at least to my knowledge, the, the, the four of us on the committee um, do not have um, our own uh, drafter or, or staff member to, to, uh, to draft. So we're sort of um, at the mercy, if you will, of the, uh, the members of the department. Um, I do think, though, that when someone does refer uh, something to the legislative committee for uh, review. I do think that there should be some norms in place in terms of, I just think as a matter of courtesy, it should go back to that person who made the referral to the legislative committee for review uh, to decide whether they want to go forward with that or, or not. Um, and then insofar as the issue of uh, how many hours uh, ahead of time, board members should be given resolutions. I really can't speak to it. I mean, I'm I'm told that resolutions were done on the fly uh, prior to my tenure on the board. Um, 
I think, I mean, just speaking as an attorney, um, I tend to not like to do things on the fly. Um, I have found when I've had to do that, whether it be, you know, mediation agreements or orders, um, I, I can think of many situations where um, taking time to actually get it right is certainly appreciated by the judge. Um, but again, I, I can't weigh in on that because what this body did before I got here, um, that may very well be the way that um, the, 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 the body at large um, decides to do things. I can only um, offer my reflections in terms of um, the process that I've tried to uh, come up with uh, without really having too much to work with um, when I uh, when I took on the, uh, the, uh, the the job, so to speak. Okay, thank you. thank you very much, Chairwoman uh, Lipton, um, Ms. Snyder. The other thing, so just to add to the breadth of the discussion of what happened before Ellen, we had resolutions sometimes come out of the agenda committee on topics or issues, so it doesn't have to come out of the legislative committee. And I would say that um, I do appreciate what she's saying about in terms of like it should go back to the person who wrote it. There should be a concept of what has already been written before and what, what, are we, what is that person saying that's different from what has been said before. And I think that we did talk about that during the um, committee meeting was let's make sure that, you know, whether I would support it or not, that it's not overlap, if you will. So, you know, there's... It could just be a topic for agenda, the agenda, next agenda, if you guys want to do that, too. Then I don't think it has to go through the legislative committee. Just a few pieces of what happened before and what happened during our committee meeting. Right. So, so to consider um, a resolution on legislation, the board could determine uh, in agenda setting, as Ms. Snyder notes, that we're going to put forward a resolution on a particular legislative bill. That's that's permissible. We can determine in the legislative committee that we want to recommend to the full board based on our conversation that begins in legislative committee, we want to recommend something associated with the current piece of legislation. We can have something referred to the legislative committee which was the case in, in terms of your public health piece for uh, reflection. And then we can have something that's freestanding and that can come from someone and that an individual member can say, you know what, I'm sending it out to the full board. Here it is. And I plan on uh, moving. It has to be out there 24 hours in advance. I plan on moving Tuesday to put this on the, the agenda. So those are, it seems to me, the four ways that something ends up being on an, an agenda. They're, they're, they're things that are a little bit more collective in the approach. They're things that are a little bit more singular in the approach to you. Yeah, I, I think that it's important that I really uh, be clear here. Because though I asked the question about the 24 hours, that's not the situation here. Because what I'm saying is that um, I gave... Um, a statement 24 hours, but I gave it to Dr. Rice and Cassandra last month, and it did not make it out to everyone. So I was unclear on how do, what's the process for getting that out. And so I think during somewhere I sent it to, to Marilyn, but then it was, uh, the onus was on me to send it out, and then it ended up going out in the middle of the meeting. So that's how that happened. I thought that it was out in that 24 meet, uh, hour uh uh, notification process. My bigger issue is is this filtering process. You know how 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 are we filtering? Because before, um, if Tom put something out to the board, we could bring it here and we could have a discussion during legislative committee. It didn't have to go through these filters. So that's that is uh, um, um, the the main question that I have. So you know, my response to you when you sent me the bills to take a look at of course it was late Sunday night, was just go ahead and send it out. And to Nikki's point, I just asked, can you please just attach my original language and let's send it out 24 hours, but it was not sent out. And um, so, um, and then the other thing is that post the legislative meeting, I received a response saying that we're good 
with moving forward with um, language. So there was just, you know, a lot of discussion there that was, that was up in the air. And um, I, I, I just wanted to make those clarifying points, but totally agree with Nikki putting it on the agenda um, and having a discussion. Any other um, questions about process or thoughts about process? Uh, President Albridge. I'll just I'll just say I think um, I think you're correct that in the past that had happened probably way too often, which is why we started the conversation about board norms so that we weren't surprised right before meetings, in the middle of meetings, with people saying, "Hey, I've got a resolution," and then putting the rest of us on the spot to have to wordsmith and decide whether or not we could support something that maybe we didn't have the context for. So we started this process of board norms, and one of the things that, as part of the board norms, that we have not instituted necessarily formally at this point, just because we haven't had the opportunity to do that, was to say, if you're going to put something, if you're going to bring something to the table the morning of the meeting and ask for it to be asked added to the agenda that you have the courtesy to send it out, and I'm not saying you didn't, to, the courtesy to send it out 24 hours in advance so that people can reflect on it before they get to the board table. Um, I, I guess from my perspective, the question I would ask is, what is the end goal? Is it to get simply get something on the agenda, in which case, yep, 24 hours, sit at the table, say I, I'm going to read my resolution, which I don't think is ideal. But you throw it out there. But the reality is you may not get the votes to actually get it on the agenda. Um, so, But if the goal is simply to be able to make your state your piece and get something out there, um, that is one way to do it. If the goal is to pass something, then there's a lot more work that has to go into it before that happens. And that's the piece that I think um, process-wise uh, you know, we need to, to kind of focus on. But again, if, if the goal is simply to put something out there, then there's multiple ways that you can make that happen. But it, there's no guarantee it's actually going to make it onto the agenda. And if it does make it onto the agenda, um, like we've seen before, uh, in which case you supplemented the entire language. Remember when, when Todd McMillan presented? That's another way to do it. Um, but I, I think the end goal, if it's to get something passed, I, I just hope that we're we're very very thoughtful about how we do that, um, so that we are well prepared when we come to the board table, um, either with our own potential res, uh, not resolution but revisions, um, or we are, say, you know, completely comfortable or somewhat comfortable with what we think we're going to be presented with. So, um, Dr. Pugh. I'm going to just, just one last thing, because that's coming, my recollection is, is coming back. Um, and again, looking at what I read in the board norms is, again, what I followed. I said to, to the two mm -hmm. of you, and I, and yes. So, the the putting these legislative discussion items on the agenda, that's, that's something I learned from Mr. McMillan, so I tried it. But typically, we would put it in the legislative agenda. We would vote it up, vote it down, or table it. Um, but it, it, again, it just didn't have the layers, uh, the filters um, that, that we have here. And I, again, welcome the discussion to determine how we move forward and, and get it in writing so it's clear. That's fair enough. I think, I think the feeling was it was um, referred to the legislative committee. The legislative committee was working on, hadn't finished it. We made some attempt to get one portion of that to the board for Tuesday. It was very late, given Oxford, given teacher shortage, given the pandemic, given the holidays, and, and, and. Um, it didn't, uh, you know, it ultimately was was a little bit of a, of a, of a best late effort to make that third piece happen. And given where people were um, this past weekend, it was just it was just hard to to wrap. It was very close. We almost pulled it off, but but in the end, it it did not um, happen. And I think that's really the issue. I think we're going to have to make a determination if people want 
it to go through the legislative committee to one build um, some reflection about a given piece or pieces and by extension some support as you mentioned madam president or whether you want to simply put something up um, and and have it be voted up or down both of those are legitimate there, there there's a, a value to each but i'm not so sure that there was a clarity around this and so we felt that having sent it to the legislative committee, it was ours to flesh out and 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 to work on, and and then and then to to Mr. Ackley's point, um, and I think to to the chair's point, Ms. Lipton's point, to get it back to the original author for for reflection. Does does this capture, on the one hand, the spirit of what you're saying? This is where we are, ish, as a committee. Um, and we were only prepared to do that given the three-part piece for the one of the three parts. So I hope that that is helpful in terms of clarification. There's more conversation that we'll have. And yes, I do think it belongs on the legislative committee agenda um, coming up. That next legislative committee agenda, I might add, is set for uh, January 6th. That in and of itself makes for a little bit of a challenge um, it's not December 28th, as I understand oh. it. Is that correct? Right, January 6th. Okay. Oh. That, that makes for a little bit of a challenge for us because that's budding up against the next state board meeting. So um, it doesn't help that uh, we, move through, um, we move through holidays and, and, and people are going to be mostly um, at a distance as a result. Anything more on... Uh, state and federal legislative updates. Yes, Dr. Pritchett. I'm just clarifying. January 6th is the next yes. legislative committee meeting? Yep. Okay, I missed that email. Okay. I had December 28th also as chair did. We will be sending out a clarification to every board that's, member. That's and fine. every board member is invited to the legislative committee. Yeah, the, um, just just so you know, the 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 full year dates that were set and sent out ends with the December twenty eighth meeting. If that is to be rescheduled and canceled, then then I would need the new dates resent out to everyone because we'll be doing, um, we'll be doing it tomorrow. Yeah, January sixth is not a date that was um, given out to to anybody. Thank you. Dr. Pugh. Just one thing, I, and I, I wrote this down. Um, because this is an action item, we might want to consider uh, when we have this discussion is, uh, uh, people are probably familiar with this, uh, a communication action registry where we're keeping note of decisions made, discussion items, um, just a little bit more meticulously, things that need to be referred out for communication because we ask about different bills and want to get information back. I don't remember when I asked. I have to go through my notes to, to see, but maybe if we have that in, captured in some specific spot, uh, it's a thought not to put any additional work on, on anyone, but I think that that helps us to, to um, keep continuity in the discussion, especially when some of us don't make it to the legislative meeting. Um, that could also be referred out to agendas. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, anything else on state and federal legislative update? Hearing none, uh, we'll move to comments by State Board of Education members. It is 413, and in the interest of time, um, everyone's at the table. Please treat this as one bite of the apple each, State Board members. Nancy? I, beg your Nancy? Oh, you don't I don't have any. One one bite of the apple each for any board member who Thanks. would like to um, to comment at four thirteen p.m. Any comments? Hearing and see, Dr. Pritchett. One one bite. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of our teachers throughout the state of Michigan um, and our students. Uh, it has been a tough year, uh, and these last several weeks have been added on to. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Leah. Thank okay. you uh, for your dedication and service to our students. Um, I appreciated the student voice, as I think all of us did. 
this morning during the SEL um, discussion. I think he gave an excellent perspective from the student point of view as to how this is helpful for the students. Um, and I uh, commend Cassandra for her comments on Oxford. Um, I am in the same place you are uh, and will be certainly ready, willing, and able to assist in any way we can as we move forward with those discussions. Um, having worked in a secondary environment, a high school environment, and in a school district, um, I caution all of us to understand that there are multiple, multiple things that were going into the tragic situation that happened in Oxford. And we need to, to just be cognizant of that uh, and wait until all of the facts are presented. And that will take a long, long time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pritchett. Anyone else uh, care to share? I will, Dr. Rice. Um, I, you know, um, uh, Nikki, you shared a few uh, months ago about one of your whys, of one of your, you know, reasons for the position that, that you take. And, um, you know, th this time of year is a time that we look back and we, we, we're thankful, we're grateful, um, and, and, uh, you know, as I think of my why, one of my whys, um, I am here um, in more ways than one. It's because I do believe in prayer <laughs> and I do appreciate thoughts and prayers. And, um, you know, uh, I am a Christian. And um, when we talk about prayer, we're, we're, we're praying to a higher being. And I have to think about uh, when I was 19 years old and I, in February of, of 1990, I uh, ended up in the hospital for two months out of nowhere with liver failure, uh, collapsed lung, uh, kidney failure. My parents stayed with me by my side that whole time. Uh, uh, six weeks was uh, University of Michigan because I had to be air flown there to that hospital. And um, they stayed there. And so I don't remember a lot, but they do. And uh, when I hear the story and the way that they tell me that story about what they had to go through as parents of a 19-year-old who uh, had all of these um, issues uh, within that short stint. And I remember uh, when they looked at my record, someone said, it looks like you have the record of a 90-year-old. I remember doctors coming in when my liver began to function and they told my parents, uh, well, my liver began to function and my kidneys failed. And they told my parents, you know, wow, look at all of these. There were plastered poster boards that people were, were putting up uh, for me. There were tons of prayers. And so there were doctors of all sorts of faith. And they said, you know, we do believe in the power of, of prayer and the people who, who are praying for you. Um, I remember one of the hardest things for me to get over when I left the hospital I had an occupational therapist, a respiratory therapist, on all kinds of medications. I was able to go to Florida a and in August of that year. I got out of the hospital in April. My hair fell out. I had no hair. I used to have to wrap my head in turbans. Um, but the hardest thing for me was that I had a, a family friend that was in the hospital who was a parent of a young child. I had another friend who was not in the hospital but had had issues. When I came back from college um, in December of that year, uh, I had to go see all of my doctors. They dismissed me. But those two family friends died, both of them parents of young children. Their children were left uh, without a mom. Uh, I remember one of those kids, uh, Demarcus Irwin. He was 16 years old. And I was at his family's house, and it was his birthday. And I was asking what was wrong with DeMarcus. He had received a letter that his mom had left him years before uh, when she died. And so I could have survivor's guilt or survivor's remorse, but um, I choose to stand with parents. I choose to stand with children. Uh, this is why I'm here in more ways than one. I mean, this is why I'm physically 
here uh, in your presence, but this is why I'm also here at that, this table. Um, thought long and hard about sharing that. It's no secret what I went through, but uh, to bring that here, um, I just thought that that was important at this point in time. And I just think about the parents. I think about the children uh, at this time with all the things that we're dealing with. So um, Merry Christmas to you and however you celebrate these holidays. Thank you very much, Dr. Pugh. We appreciate you sharing that. Um, other, um, other reflections? Um, it's been a full meeting. It's been a full year. And um, I wish everyone the best during this, this holiday season and for the new year. Um, be healthy, be safe, be strong. Um, rest up. We have a lot of work.